that as well. Two, one. Okay, guys, so uh, this is day three, and uh, we have covered uh, some portion of our uh you know uh course topics here uh just uh, still we're in the beginning and what we have here is right now server zero one uh we're going slow but we're trying to understand everything and going ahead so uh, uh the main thing is do we understand or not right so then the second thing is how to do it that's the second most important thing so server one server two we have uh, we are planning to make it uh, uh as uh, providing the services for AAA. uh so uh, active directory role will be providing that service directory will be providing AAA service authentication authorization accounting it does provide a lot of other services uh, but that's just to you know authentication authorization the main the basic then it's the central database it's uh, offers central inventory central security uh, for a, and then we talked about also the concepts of forest tree site domain uh, we uh, reach the domain level by that time then second uh, main service we want to provide is name resolution from DNS so or in a typical network of course you need these to be uh, in uh, perfect condition and perfectly configured and uh, also best practices we can follow uh, then DHCP for IP management will be putting that uh, third role and uh, global catalog gets installed with it so triple a slash gc slash group policies there are many others uh so we're going to talk about global catalog as well and then uh, uh here then we re actually copy uh, uh domain admin account uh into net admin so we're going to copy uh we're not going to use domain administrator account we're going to be uh, copying it into a new name called net admin and uh, then we're going to be only using throughout the course net admin account here and uh, also uh, then we're going to be creating uh, 390 users with powershell uh, so 390 users with powershell and uh, we have a ready-made script here so we don't have to create that uh, and uh, after that we're going to uh, join the second server to domain which we configured in the previous class uh, then we will later try to make it a replica DC and try to uh, learn about replication uh, between the domain controllers, uh, Active Directory uh, ADSS, which is Active Directory Sites and Services, just to have an introduction to all the areas uh, that we need to know about, uh, you know, two domain controllers talking to each other, uh, ADSS, uh, ADUC, Active Directory Users and Computers, Active Directory Sites and Services here. Um, so all these uh, these are not very long laps, but the main thing is, do we understand what we're doing, right? So, um, and guys, uh, if you're not repeating the labs at home, you are wasting your time right now, right? So you must repeat all the labs at home. You must watch the videos. Suppose you don't have that, uh, uh, you know, hi-fi or high-end computer at home. Are you watching the videos again and are you making the notes from the video, right? you have to understand what we are talking about if you're not understanding you are simply wasting your time here go do some other course uh, try to have your time useful right or netflix man no I'm just kidding so uh but uh, if you want to seriously do this you have to repeat the videos uh you have to do the labs without that you will not gain that confidence to talk to each other about or talk to the interviewer talk to your bosses talk to the audience about 2016 because if you haven't done it, you don't have that confidence in you, right? So you have to redo it, redo it, redo it in order to really gain that confidence. See all those possible errors here instead of uh, seeing them in production environment. Try to see all the errors here, right? And market needs troubleshooters. So we're installing the first time. That's not what market needs. Well, it does, but after installation, normally you will get a, a network where you have to manage it, not install it from the scratch, right? So we have to learn troubleshooting. So troubleshooting is when you repeat the labs again and again. This is the perfect lab that I'm going to show you because I've gone through the errors and the majority of the errors are gone. So this is a perfect lab. You do not need a perfect lab right now. Uh, you need to redo the lab and then build your concepts again after watching this. When you're doing that, you might do some mistake, right? So why this error came? What did I do? Troubleshoot that. So first of all, you should be a good Googler. Well, that's a new term. I just made it up. Anyway, uh, so it's uh, Googler means, you know, as many times it saved my job. 
So boss says, hey, do this. Oh, sure, no problem. I had no idea how to do that. So uh, I said, sure, no problem. And he went away and I go, whoa, whoa Google, d -d 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 how to create PowerShell script for exchange uh, security groups uh, converting to you know uh, those distribution groups. So I had no idea, but there were so many scripts there. At once I came up with a script which was already there. I modified it and there you go. Boss is happy. So you have to really be a good search uh, searcher or Googler, right? So troubleshooting is the main skill we need to develop. If you're getting errors at home, let me know. But did you troubleshoot before letting me know? So if you want the plate in your hands, yes, I'm here. But you don't get to learn anything then, right? So try to troubleshoot first. And I ask normally all the students now, whoever tell me, oh, this is an error. So I first said, did you troubleshoot yourself first? Because I can tell you now. But then you don't learn the troubleshooting aspect of that. Go Google it first. Then they come after two hours, okay. Then I'm at least sure, hey, they tried their self, uh, their best, and there's some of its you know sharpness for troubleshooting is there, right? So develop that troubleshooting skill by redoing the labs yourself. If you're not redoing, uh, you must have a hardware first, good hardware. Try to get that as soon as possible. This is your investment for your future, right? So don't look about uh, say, worry about the money. Of course, money is a real worry, and it's easier to, to say it here. But uh, get your credit card, get your hardware here and then try to do that lab ASAP. Majority of the students by the uh, third, fourth week, they have that and they re redo the lab so many times, they're telling me what to do after some time. So some of them, right? Uh, one student crazily did the lab of failover clustering maybe eight or nine times. So he knew each and every step of that most important lab. That is coming in our, our course as well. And you're gonna see it's gonna be complicated, but I'm gonna, that's my job to make it easy, right? But the main thing is, you know, really do you uh, make your time useful here. Right, so uh, let's go ahead guys. And so one, uh, we were talking about, uh, we were trying to start the installation of Active Directory there. And uh, uh, you may have uh, uh, received that document. Suppose uh, I uh, promise you uh, to sign a document. If uh, you didn't get it, please do email me. Right, and second thing, do we all have my email? Right, so if you have, uh, that's good. If you don't have, let me know. And uh, my number as well. Okay, guys, so uh, what we were trying to do here, let's just log into server one here and try to uh, install Active Directory. We were trying that, and but we were discussing so much, and that's the main thing. We need to understand uh, how the whole infrastructure really works, and uh, in the uh, production environment, how do we, uh, you know, what are the best practices, uh, in what cases we should use which feature here, right? So try to uh, make the notes repeat the labs, watch the videos again, at least make your notes if you cannot do the lab for now, right? But uh, you know, the time will pass and uh, nobody will follow up, then you will just forget everything and then you say, oh, all time wasted. Okay, cool, not cool. Okay guys, uh, so server one, if you're started, everyone logged in? Okay, so if everyone logged in, uh, we were talking about uh, those concepts here for, uh, you know, uh, uh, forest, tree, site, domain. I could be throwing at you some uh, quiz questions there. Let's see who was uh, up to it and who did repeat all the uh, concepts, who did get those concepts uh, clearly. So uh, the more you participate, the better. Um, well, I don't know who's not participating. I was wondering, hey, what teacher is talking about? Okay, uh, so anyway, that's for your own good that I should be following up with you, right? Uh, I could also just keep on ignoring, oh, this topic is done, okay, let's go next. No, we cannot go next if you did not understand, right? So you have to understand that. Uh, it's for your own good, and that's what you gave the money here for, right? So make sure you understand. Uh, so uh, we talked about uh, forest, tree, site, domain. Uh, when we're starting Active Directory, of course, these will come again, uh, but uh, we can then uh, discuss at that time as well uh, so uh, about domain and domain controller, we were talking about domain that you can do day-to-day -day tasks on uh, the domain level uh, and some of the examples were uh, you can create users or computers or uh, groups or OUs or organizational units. We're going to do all that as well throughout the course uh, for different labs. Uh, and uh, if we go down to domain controller here, so we were talking about, we created some maps in the previous uh, uh, you know, class and then we tried to talk about, suppose we have different branches here. So how do we uh, sim uh, connect the, to each other? Uh, what are trees? And then what are uh, the root, do what is do root domain here? Where are the child domains there? Uh, so normally we need to keep those environments or th those maps uh, in our mind. 
and uh, try to understand uh, suppose this is a child domain and this is uh, well tree domain is a concept that we're going to be discussing later it's a little advanced for now uh, so suppose you have domain controllers here uh, one uh, root DC here and one uh, replica DC one uh, uh, well if, if it's a new domain it's a root DC for that domain uh, and then uh, here is just replica DCs so we did talk about that design as well that when in what situation we put uh, root DC or root domain controller actually I should just put the whole name root domain controller because we haven't talked about that yet and then replica DCs DC is domain controller right so then here of uh, root DC some uh, agree to that some do not agree to that that the, the child domain first domain controller should, should be called root DC or not uh, but replica DC so replica DC is just a partner DC offering the same services that the root DC is offering right and then there is replica DC here and there is replica DC here DC here right so uh, we did talk about that uh, child domain will be only created uh, when you need total separation of administration so child domain equals uh, total separation of ad administration right so i've just added a, another word here ad administration and uh, so that's why uh, you would know that when to use child domain when not to use the child domain right so uh, okay and uh, here root domain we have already created so suppose we haven't created we're about to create that but when you create the first domain of course uh, it uh, it is the forest is created uh, site uh, of course now we have how many sites do we have in the on this picture okay you're saying three anyone else three yeah three okay everyone agrees to that mm -hmm. okay some are like hmm <laughs> okay yeah. so here uh, yes we have three sites here and uh, forest site tree how many trees do you see uh, well okay how many trees could there be if we have just started to create our network yeah. one exactly so the domain name we give uh, all the objects uh, that we create will be following that domain name so of course uh, that's just one tree here and how many domains do you see on this picture he says two anyone agrees hmm? you say three domains two. anyone else two anyone else it's going now two one two two sold okay that's not label though right the other one's not label what label I mean yeah this is a child domain yeah so there's a child domain I've written and, and then there's a root domain I've written other than that, I did not write anything. Hey, you're getting the hints from me. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah, so it is two domains right now. Because I did not type here, uh, type here uh, replica, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, tree domain or child domain. So it just has replica DCs. And it has root DC of its own. Because there's a new domain here, not new, child domain. The child, and this is the parent domain, of course. Uh, so when I have a branch here, and that has just a replica DC. We are about to install a replica DC. We don't know yet what's a replica DC. But I'm just telling you, just get used to these maps and uh, get used to these pictures here. So we could know right away, oh, OK, yeah, this is going on here. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, one tree here, three sites here, two domains here. OK. So at once, the picture is clear, right? So if you see that uh, anywhere, somebody's planning something or somebody's uh, explaining uh, their own networks, you can just actually know what's going on in the background, right? So this is a whole forest here. And uh, there are two domains right now, but, and hopefully it, with the previous uh, diagrams, previous uh, uh, class, uh, please do create those notes. They are telling you concepts, right? So take your, create your notes out of every picture. Okay, in this picture, I see this, 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 this is this, and this is being proven. Then I create actually four or five pictures there, right, in the previous class. So we discussed a lot of concepts. We're going to be repeating them anyway, uh, but you have to understand what's going on, right? So, uh, but how many domain controllers do you see here? Okay, I haven't even talked about domain controllers. Uh, it's a 
member server or a standalone server having Active Directory installed on top of that. But if it's the first, uh, suppose uh, uh, if it's the first uh, server, which is right now we have two standalone servers, right? Standalone servers. There is no central domain here right now. There we just created a Windows. We installed Windows 2016. We installed second uh, server Windows 2016, and we gave static IP, renamed it, activated it, and snapshot it. That's all we did, right? Till now. Uh, so now we're about to install Active Directory on the first server, right? So uh, the first server will create all this, what we were talking about till now, and it is called root DC of this domain. Uh, and uh, so here, well, that's a silly question. It's pretty obvious, but how many domain controllers do you see here? Six. Total domain controllers in the picture, how many you see there? Six. Six? Anyone else? Agreeing to that? Disagreeing to that? How many domain controllers do you see here? Six. Only one? Okay. Anyone else? Two. Three? Domain controllers. Because we haven't talked about it, it's not a quiz right now. It's just, uh, you know, another way to explain things that should just get you and you should not uh, forget it after that, right? We're just guessing right now as well. But whatever information I've given here, Three. right? Total domain controllers in this picture. Two. Total. Two. Total. T O T A L. <laughs> Since you didn't say root or replica, there are six. Uh, how many total domain controllers? So uh, you're saying six, right? Three. Anyone else? Root and replica. Total in the picture. I'm not giving any other hints right now. So we, when we explain, you're gonna see. Oh, okay. But that you most probably will not forget, right? Uh, so uh, yes, right now there are. Six domain controllers. Oh, there should be a drummer here. Then, okay. Then uh, how how are there six here? How are there six? Uh, each site I've put DC or domain controller, right? So uh, root domain controller, the first domain controller that created the whole forest site tree domain. The rest are replica DCs, or not the rest. In this branch, suppose this is the Toronto branch here, tour branch. This is the NY branch, New York branch. This is the London branch, LON. So uh, now Toronto branch uh, has a root DC and we're about to create that. Then we're gonna create a helper DC. When I say helper DC, uh, terminology wise, it is called replica DC, right? So what do you mean by helper DC? The first one is offering AAA name resolution uh, and uh, you know GC, global catalog services. Uh, group policies uh, and a lot of other things but we just don't want the first one to do that we want we can have two DSCPs here as well uh, and they could be in uh, split scope configuration or high can uh, you know a failover clustering replica DCs are just helper DCs offering the same services as other domain controllers right so AAA could be offered from here replica DC as well name resolution because we'll install a DNS role as well uh, alongside with Active Directory. Active Directory is a separate role, DNS is a separate role, but they have to work together. Either you can install it as an independent DNS or you can install it, uh, you know, in AD integrated DNS. So Active Directory integrated DNS, right? So uh, AAA, name resolution, and global catalog services could be offered from the replica DC here as well. So this means also that you have uh, high availability for AAA, you have high availability for name resolution services, Resolution or oh, resolution. Okay, that's uh, the strong spanners. Uh, so please ignore that. And uh, global catalog services is also highly available. When I say highly available, do you agree to that? If I just create this uh, scenario here, are they highly available right now? Highly available means what? They are available even if you lose any one domain controllers. Although this will, if this goes down, it's taking down FISMO roles with it. We haven't talked about FISMO roles yet. Uh, five FISMO roles, right? The, those are doing unique tasks, but uh, you know, I just took a name. So suppose any one of the domain controller goes down here, the other one is running the show still. The traffic will, the, uh, when the users are, uh, username, password is written there, uh, authentication service is still working on the other domain controller. Name resolution service is still working if the users uh, want to access the network resources by name, right? And global catalog services are still there because it is offering forest wide search catalog, right? So, uh, and user log on, two things. So we're gonna talk about that, but when I create a diagram here, 
just to depict that okay we must uh, Microsoft always recommends please do have two domain controllers in any site you have if you have like uh, you know maybe uh, 500 or 2000 uh, even 100 some uh, administrators have up to you how many resources you have but if you have two domain controllers in any site uh, that's always a very good idea because then you offer these critical services uh, highly available these services are highly available now right so in this site suppose we have 2000 users here and in this site we have uh, you know uh, 5000 users here uh, and in this site maybe we have 10000 users here so that's a lot of users that really need to uh, have uh, AAA services authentication authorization accounting name of the solution services they need to search across the forest as well so if you don't put a local DC here all this traffic request will have to go on van and that van traffic uh, we do not want to increase that van traffic because already some critical application suppose it's a hospital suppose it's an insurance company suppose it's a you know military institute or uh, something else right so or banks so they already have the third-party applications that needs to be updated on the van so van is a slow connection you don't want regular uh, these kind of traffics to be also traveling over the van you need to keep the van fast for critical services although these are critical but if you offer these services locally in every site uh, users will users request will not be traveling over the van then right so you have to be smart you have to keep the van available for more critical services or business oriented services right although this is the you know running the whole show anyway uh, so still we have to keep uh, the van uh, available now uh, that said uh, we when we install Active Directory it creates first forest uh, right now we have just one site uh, one tree there and yeah so if the replica DC is in the root site on the uh, so if you have uh, a replica DC inside New York site so domain controllers uh, there is one statement always that I'm gonna be keep, uh, I'm gonna keep on repeating that DC stock to each other after modification DC stock to each other within 45 seconds up to one minute inside LAN so uh, as soon as you make a made a modification here DCs will update each other within the LAN environment local area network environment within one branch in 45 seconds up to one minute normally this is maximum we're talking about normally they update right away right but across the van if you put a replica DC here you put a replica DC here they talk to each other every 180 minutes or three hours that's the default we can change that but you have to be careful when you're changing that like, yeah my question is that my question uh -huh. is like if at the Toronto, Toronto site the replica DC fails oh fails okay right. Will it work at the New York side or not? Uh, well, it will work. Uh, replica DC in New York is. Copy, right? Yeah, it, it's an exact copy. Exactly. Till the last second. Well, not till the last second. For last three hours, whatever you put. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. That's not independent. That's independent. Yeah, that's separate and independent. We just copy the image. Exactly. Well, uh, we image. don't call it image, but, but uh, yeah. it is an exact replica of that. We normally separately install that, and then it gets updates through replication. Uh, when it is installing and after that every three hours across the van and after that so let's every yeah make any modifications on Toronto site yeah and only update the New York, uh, New York site yeah it will update every three hours yeah. by default it is every three hours three hour. you can change it to 90 minutes you can change it to 60 minutes or you can change it to even more than 180 minutes okay. right so by default it is that so yes if this replica suppose if I uh, actually make that diagram which you asked that if it, this goes down so definitely it's not affecting the triple a name resolution GC in this branch or in this branch uh, it is going to be affecting those users uh, which were connected at that time uh, and those uh, users just have to reconnect or their connections will be redirected to the other one but uh, if you have two domain controllers that's it uh, you're good in this branch as well so Microsoft says go ahead and create two domain controllers right with DNS name resolution uh, domain controllers uh, so GC gets uh, installed when Active Directory is installed with it. Uh, now it is easy to install a second domain controller. You have virtual environment, right? Hyper-V or VMware Workstation. Just install another virtual machine, give it less RAM, less processor, and it's just giving you network services of AAA and uh, name resolution, which are very critical, right? So it's always good to have two. If first one is on physical, you can have the second one on virtual as well. Both can be virtual, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, so. Okay, guys.
but we were talking about then domain controller. So domain controller is that operating system on which you have installed Active Directory. Either it's a root DC, which will be the first one only, then the rest are all replica DCs. The main thing is an operating system with Active Directory installed on it is our domain controller. It is controlling the domain, controlling the network. Active Directory is controlling the whole thing, right? So replica DC has Active Directory. Suppose you have another server, another list of, long list of servers here, right? So servers, servers, servers and Active Directory is not installed on them. So what do you do with that? What are they called? They are joined to the domain. So, well, actually, you know what? Maybe I did not even mention that before. So there are domain controllers. And member servers. And uh, standalone servers. Uh, stand servers, no, stand alone. Standalone servers. And uh, then there is client machines. Well, you know that Windows 7, Windows 8, right? Uh, but uh, what is the difference between uh, these three? Domain controllers, member servers, standalone servers. Anyone can guess? Um, servers, the they are joined to the domain. So uh, those server operating systems that have joined the domain are connected to Active Directory are called member servers, yeah? Aren't they also known as standalone servers? Well, no, standalone servers are standing alone. No, just kidding. So standalone servers are not joined to any central authority. Okay. So so standalone servers, we right now our two servers are member servers, domain controllers, or standalone servers, the two servers we have right now. What are these from these three types? Mm -hmm. The two servers we have right now, are they member servers? Stand -alone. Or standalone? Stand or domain controllers? So you're saying member? You're Stand -alone. saying? Standalone, Stand yeah. These are domain controllers, the first two. Oh, okay. So uh, again, I'll rephrase the question here. Uh, these two servers here. Yeah, Sorry, uh, yeah, I meant these two servers. So right now, these two servers, which we all have, mm -hmm. are they domain controllers, standalone servers, or uh, member servers? Stand -alone. Stand -alone. Stand -alone. Stand -alone. We all agree to that. Yeah, because if I to the domain, yes. And that there is no domain to no no definitely, as you said. So these, so I was, I meant that, yeah. Maybe uh, you know you thought that I'm talking about the diagram here. So it is these two. These are standalone servers. They're not joined to anything. So we understand that what is domain controllers. We, uh, we understand that member servers will, if they're joined to the domain, they are member servers. Standalone servers, they are not joined to any central authority. Uh, so we all understand that, right? Client machines are client machines. Okay. So they are Windows Seven. They are client operating systems like uh, Windows Seven, Windows XP, Windows Eight, Windows Ten. Uh, and especially it is it has to be professional edition okay so uh, uh, professional edition uh, ultimate edition business edition uh, but they should not be home editions right home editions are not NOCs no objection certificate right no just kidding so in NOCs are network operating systems okay NOS NOSs right why did I say an NOC anyway I didn't have that safe so okay uh, so NOSs are not uh, network operating systems, not not. So network operating systems are or NOSes. NOS. NOS means network operating system, which means they are meant for network. Windows 7 version, Windows 8, Windows 10. They have to be Windows 7 professional, 8 professional, 10 professional, or ultimate or business editions. Normally these are meant for uh, to be used on networks. They have the security features. Uh, they have the compatibility with whatever policies. Uh, you're implementing from domain controllers, right? So, uh, so NOS or network operating systems. When I, I'm not talking about servers here, I'm talking about client computers here. Am I in front of it? No. Okay. That here I'm in front of it, right? Okay. Anyway, so uh, here I'm talking about only client operating systems. Uh, we cannot have home editions there, right? In the network home editions are for home okay so they're not meant for they don't have that they're not secure uh, they're only meant for single user uh, usage so here client running systems and uh, when if you have in 7 8 10 uh, then you, you would go for pro ultimate or uh, ultimate business edition they just give it different names as long as they're not home editions we're good right they are network operating systems so they are compatible with security and networking features. Okay guys, um, we do all agree to that, right? 
So uh, okay, guys. Uh, so let's go ahead. Domain controllers we talked about. Then there are security groups. You know what? Uh, we should just start the lab. Or okay, organizational units. Uh, I really want to show you, but they are containers. They are simply folders, containers that help us organize our users and computers into departments and branches. We can attach group policies to these containers and folders. So organizational units are just, you know, we call it a, a container or it's a yellow folder that you get create, uh, you create inside the Active Directory. And you can attach, so it is, suppose you have 10 branches, there are 10 uh, uh, departments there. So you can create 10 folders and they contain users, computers, or child OUs, three things. You can put groups inside as well, but normally, suppose it's sales department, so you're gonna create one container called sales, and then put users and computers of sales there. You can attach group policies there. Now there are 2,000 plus group policies there. Uh, so a simple example of a group policy, block USB. So you create a group policy, uh, block USB, and attach it to a container. If it's a New York container, it's a Toronto container, whichever users are inside the container will get that policy. Others will not get that. If you attach it to the domain level, uh, it's gonna affect everyone, including you, right? <laughs> so never attach it to a domain. Uh, uh, so anyway, if you have a reason, go ahead. Uh, so groups, uh, containers, we're gonna uh, uh, you know create all those one by one. Oh, I'm just giving a one-liner here. Uh, groups also, there are two ways we can uh, you know uh, understand them. Uh, just a brief one-liner for those is the, uh, these are collection of users or computers that can be given access to any network resource or can be added to any other built-in security group. So uh, there is security group here, security groups, but we're going to do separate uh, topics on all those. And then there are distribution groups. Okay. Distribution groups equals uh, email groups. So you just send emails, a uh, email, okay. Email groups here, oh seriously, okay. So email groups and security groups. So what are, so the distribution groups, you just create one group, add users, you send an email to the group, uh, you know, uh, address, and all the members get that email, just like our Google group, right? That's a distribution group as well. But we create it when we have a, uh, messaging application like Exchange Server. Suppose you ha you must have a messaging application or you know Exchange Server or uh, Office 365. You must have connected to that uh, or maybe you know other uh, third-party messaging applications uh, that can help you do that. Uh, uh, create that, those distribution groups. So in Exchange 2016 course, Exchange 2013, we normally create distribution groups uh, as well uh, for the company or in Office 365 class. Security groups, uh, members of these groups uh, can be given uh, go even, given access uh, to any network resource, uh, any network resource, or they could be added uh, to a built-in uh, privileged built-in. Uh, privileged uh, security group like administrators i.e uh, administrators which is a bad idea to put you know a lot of users there or you know account operators group or uh, backup operators group uh, there are many built-in groups created by Microsoft and Microsoft has given carefully uh, privileges according to the task they are supposed to do backup operators group these are just examples right so uh, so the groups here will be uh, just two types here. One is a security group, which with which you can give access to their members to any network resource like shared folder, printers there, or uh, you have already built-in privileged security uh, groups uh, here, actually this. But I'm just giving you a rough figure here. Uh, we're gonna be doing the labs for these and we're gonna try to understand what's going on. Uh, how can we use them in different labs? You're gonna be, you, we will have to use these anyway. So we're gonna understand that uh, uh, in that. And then security groups there, are, uh, and then, then there's distribution group, right? So distribution group we only have, we can only use when we have messaging applications, right? Okay, I'll be sending you that uh, this uh, uh, you know uh, document anyway. But uh, definitely, so users and computers. Uh, the definition, uh, you know, users are users and computers are computers. Okay, let's go ahead. Oh, okay. How do I define users? Anyway, 
uh, users are just objects in Active Directory that use resources of the network. Simple, right? You can edit users and you know, uh, they are security principles through which you can securely access network resources within the Active Directory. Computers, uh, domain joined computers, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, have their own unique states uh, and uh, they only domain joined computers can be used to access network resources. That could be the definition for that. Then there's standalone uh, uh, servers, member servers, and domain controllers. We just talked about those. Uh, so I'm going to send you the document and you could just, you know, uh, get it from there uh, what they are. But member server, it is a member of a domain centralized network. Domain controller, it is hosting the centralized network or domain. Uh, it is hosting, right? So the Active Directory role is installed on uh, the operating system. That operating system is, uh, is called, or that server is called domain controller, right? So we're gonna, uh, we're about to install that. Those, these uh, notes will, these concepts will come again now, right? So we're gonna discuss that. I'm gonna quiz you as well. And uh, let's see uh, who comes up with what uh, concepts here. So we talked about this. I'm gonna send you that document, uh, but the main thing is the diagrams we created. Please create your own notes from those diagrams. The discussions we did, please create your own notes from those discussions especially because you have to discuss in the interviews. Uh, it's not that you will say, oh, I've installed Active Directory and an interview will say, okay, good. <laughs> we like you, we need you. It's not like that. They will discuss, they will ask you scenarios, right? And you have to explain those scenarios. So you have to take down the notes from those discussions from previous classes, right? So main thing is, what are we doing? Do we understand what we're doing, right? So uh, if we go ahead a little, our plan, as I put in the uh, first, uh, you know, uh, uh, diagram here, that uh, we install Active Directory and DNS will get installed with it. We, it's our choice. And then uh, later we can just go ahead with these tasks. We are going towards creating our uh, basic network where uh, we are trying to follow best practices and are trying to make a replica of a production environment uh, at least we can go as near as possible and what are the practices for a production environment that we should be implementing while we're creating our own uh, you know domain from the scratch right so we're, we're going to be discussing those concepts again and i'm going to be throwing questions at you true or false or you know other things so let's uh, try to understand each and everything and then second most important thing is how to do it right so Everyone on server one? And uh, if you're on server one, do we all see our best buddy here, server manager? Mm -hmm. So all the links are there, and uh, you will need all those links to actually manage the whole environment, not only just this server, right? So uh, if you are on the server manager in server one, do we all see dashboard? And do we all see add roles and features? If we do, let's go ahead and click add roles and features. We're about to install Active Directory, as in the previous class, I also said that it, just installing Active Directory is a three, four minute lab, but we need to understand each and every page here. So we could take two classes just to do that lab, right? Uh, so there are so many things there, and of course there are so many more things that will be coming in the background as roles. So if you're on the first page, before you begin, let's just go ahead, it's just an introduction. Let's click next. Anyone following behind, let me know. Well, throughout the lab. Uh, Role-based or feature-based installation, we will always go for, uh, throughout the courses here, role-based or feature-based installation. Remote desktop services installation or VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, that's advanced. But uh, the concept is about, uh, you know, if you have done or heard about Citrix, uh, so this is application virtualization and virtualized desktops that the users get. Uh, it's not easy, but uh, if you go through either remote desktop services of Microsoft or uh, Fusion software or VMware, or the you know Citrix itself. These three are offering the VDI uh, virtual desktop infrastructure, where you have virtual desktops as well as uh, applications are virtualized on ten servers, and you can offer their icons on ten thousand computers, right, all over the van across the globe to any tablet or any cell phone as well. Uh, the applications are just running on ten servers or two hundred servers or twenty servers. You know, uh, you don't have to install applications on all ten thousand computers, right? So it is so important that uh, Future 500 companies or the main big companies of the globe, you will see Citrix is there because Citrix is leader in VDI, right? So, okay guys, uh, let's just go ahead. We're gonna be installing just a role here, role-based or feature-based installation. So we're gonna keep it clicked here and click next. 
Uh, make sure it is server one. That's a very good window here. Uh, before it didn't didn't used to be here, so we would mistakenly install some role on some other server. So server one is here. IP address correct. Click next. And then of course uh, these are all the list of roles, uh, and uh, they are all very important, critical in a production environment. We're gonna go one by one according to the exam objectives. So click the second one, which is Active Directory Domain Services here. Second one, Active Directory Domain Services. Click that. As soon as it clicks, uh, so uh, you know Microsoft has programmed in such a way that uh, features, whatever important features are needed to be inst uh, to install with Active Directory, it's going to automatically pop up that. Of course, we need those features, especially this RSAT tool, Remote Server Administration tool, and uh, it will install all the necessary features that uh, will let us uh, use a lot of links for Active Directory here. So RSAT has to be there. Uh, RSAT, uh, there's another importance for that. Suppose you become a system administrator in some company and they give you a laptop or a desktop. So uh, you're not supposed to connect to domain controllers directly there, right? Although you can from remote desktop, yes. Uh, but normally you install RSAT tools in, uh, in separately in Windows 8 or Windows 7 or Windows 10. RSAT, right? R-S-A-T or remote server administration tool. So once you have that, you have all the Active Directory links there. DNS, DHCP links there automatically in your laptop or desktop. Uh, if you have the privileges of a system administrator, or domain administrator, or domain admin, uh, then through your Windows 7 laptop, with the help of RSAT tools, you can connect to the Active Directory DNS and just remotely configure, you know, uh, all the environment, right? You just need to have a uh, privileged account and RSAT tools in your any client machine to uh, remotely connect that, right? So uh, with the privileged, uh, uh, you know, users uh, only, they can access that. Okay, so let's click add features. Whenever this pops up next time, uh, for any other extra feature, or uh, extra roles, uh, so we're just gonna click add features because yes, we need those. Okay, so this is installing the binary files or the helping files that will later help us configure Active Directory, right? So we need these files to actually start the wizard of Active Directory later. So if it is clicked, then go ahead, click next. Uh, well, the necessary features have been already selected, so we don't have to uh, select anything extra. If you're an advanced user, or if you know which other features you want ap uh, apart from this installation, you can just go ahead and do that, but uh, I would just leave it at that, because we're just concerning on installing Active Directory right now. So let's click Next without uh, selecting anything here in the Features page. So click Next. Now in 2016, when you're installing, it gives you that uh, Active Directory domain services and also Azure Active Directory, a separate online service can provide simplified identity and access management, security reporting, single sign-on to cloud and on-premises web apps. So as we talked about the plan as well, uh, I'm gonna suggest in, uh, you know, uh, I'll let you know before that class that please go ahead to godaddy.com uh, website and buy your domain. It is, I think $2, minimum minimum is $1.80 for one year. You can just uh, buy a domain Maybe you are, you know, you have a dream to uh, open your own uh, IT company one day. So you can just buy that name or just your name, .com or .ca or .xyz, whatever. So students normally buy, go for, uh, you know, $2 domain. Uh, they, it is $10 normally, but you have to go for the, you know, options there. So we're going to buy from godaddy.com uh, a new domain. We're going to attach it to our Azure subscription. Then we're going to uh, attach that Azure to our uh, on premises, each one of us will be connecting from our Active Directory to the cloud Active Directory, right? So we're going to be doing synchronization as well. That's a lab you have to do. You have to know cloud, right? Because cloud is in now with every software you install Exchange Server. There's an online version of Exchange, Exchange Online, right? Its name is Exchange Online, and uh, SCCM supports System Center Configuration Manager. Uh, they, it every software has its online version now, and they are in the cloud. Cloud is somebody else's data center. That's all. So you must know cloud very well uh, okay guys uh, from Microsoft side I would recommend please do know uh, office 365 because majority of the companies have that or are going towards that uh, all the applications are already there you just have to buy that subscription anyway so uh, here Azure Active Directory we will later connect to that as well but for now let's click next and of course, uh, if it requires a restart, go ahead and restart. If it does not require restart, it will not restart. So normally I always click that. Uh, if you're installing a role during the peak hours, which is a very bad idea, suppose you really need that role, uh, don't in select this because suppose some users are connected to them 
that server and it you cause a restart uh, but it's a, always a good idea to always do it when users are not connected to that server then go ahead and click the restart so if any pending restart uh, if there is any it will restart otherwise it will not restart so press yes here uh, it is very useful and never leave any windows with a pending restart it's going to haunt you until you're doing some very complicated configuration and at the end of it it's gonna say oh you want to implement uh, that configuration but please restart from the pending restart before there was a restart required you didn't do that so then you have to cancel out the whole configuration and go back and restart first right so this is a very good option here so go ahead and click install yep. SCCM system center configuration management yeah uh, so it is required uh, in large organizations. So uh, you can just uh, manage thousands of computers. Uh, you can make, uh, you can install a software on them. You can uh, upgrade them. Suppose they are Windows 7 to Windows 10. Uh, thousands of them by one, just one machine. Or you can create a master image and deploy uh, operating system with applications, operating system uh, with any types of other configurations. It's an enterprise application that installs on a member server, mm -hmm. and uh, it is complicated. And normally, banks have those jobs, SCCM jobs, SCCM experts that require governments or big hospitals. They need where thousands of computers are there, and you can uh, make changes remotely through the through the SCCM server. So any changes you want to make, you can make it on thousands of computers in one go. Uh, so it is complicated, but doable. I delivered that course two times uh, on online only. But I'm pushing it to be here uh, soon. Uh, SCCM, but uh, SCCM also has its online version. So, okay, guys, uh, let me know when everyone is on this page. Everyone there, right? No. Yeah. Okay. So you can see here if you reach, uh, you don't press close here when you once reach here. But suppose you do press close, there's a yellow triangle that also shows the same thing. I'm just showing you now. That promote this server to admin controller is of uh, appear you know it is here as well as well as it is here. So if suppose you click close here, you can go to yellow triangle and promote click that promote the server. If you haven't closed it, that same URL is here. Promote the server to admin controller here as well, right? So if done, right? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, we're still doing that, right? Or done? Still doing. Still doing. Okay. So this is just the binary files or the helping files uh, for uh, Active Directory. Now when we click this, promote this server. Th so this server is right now a standalone server or a member server? This server one here. It's a standalone server, right? And we're about to, okay, done. Done? Hey, somebody's not, fo you're following the lab, right? Yes. Okay, cool. But man, you're patient, that's good. System administrations have that inhale, exhale feature, patience. So we sometimes sit for hours and hours. Okay, there should be a documentary on system administration. <laughs> okay. So in what channel? Don't say the channel name. Okay. So <laughs> uh, discovery channel, right? Okay. Done? Okay, all done here, right? So, okay, guys. Uh, promote the server developing control. Let's click that. So how far are you? Oh. Uh oh, something happened? <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay, so uh, let's click that, promote the server controller. If you missed it, uh, there's a yellow triangle that shows the same thing. We, you know that, right? So go ahead and promote the server to admin controller. You should be seeing this window now. Some of us may have installed Active Directory so many times that they're like, hey, teacher, come on, go ahead, please. You're boring me to death. So, uh, but anyway, we need to understand each and every feature here. We can't just go ahead, otherwise, it is a, just a two minute lab. lab. Okay, so add a domain control, suppose, uh, uh, well not suppose, we are there on deployment configuration. So there are three options here, add a domain controller to an existing domain. We haven't created a domain yet, but if we wanted to add a replica DC or a helper DC, that would be the option we would select after the domain once has been created as second server we're going for. So on second server, we're gonna do that. Second thing is add a new domain to an existing forest. I was talking about two types of domains here, child domain and Child domain and? Parent. And? Oh, sorry, okay. Um, there are total three types. One is just the root domain. Tree domain. Child domain, tree domain. There are no others, right? So root domain, of course, obviously, is there, and you're correct. 
uh, root domain, that's the first domain, right? The, but the second other type we can create is child domain, third other type is tree domain, right? So if you want to create a child domain or a tree domain, you will go for the second option. Again, both are for very specific scenarios that we're going to be discussing with production environment, how it affects that, right? So we're not creating a child domain, we're not creating a tree domain, of course, it needs already a forest uh, to be there. So we are not going for this option, but later we're going to be. Uh, and then of course, right now we're creating a new forest here, right? So everyone there, add a new forest. And of course, uh, let's just give it net plus domain dot local. It's not case sensitive, just for spellings I'm doing that. It's not case sensitive. Net plus domain dot local. Okay, uh, make sure whatever spellings are there, you have to then remember those spellings. Uh, some students here just make a mistake of a spelling and then they have to live with it uh, throughout the course. And uh, sometimes when I'm putting here net plus domain, they just follow me instead of their whatever spelling they put now. So please be careful about that. Uh, it's not case sensitive. Uh, you can just put a small case as well. So if we have all put it, let's click next. Okay, this page. So a lot of options here. Uh, select functional level of the new forest and root domain. So forest functional level, that's another place where you get to choose some of the forest level features here. Uh, forest function level and then domain functional level, right? Then there is uh, DNS, you want to install it or not. Global catalog, uh, RODC, root rolling, do, uh, real domain controller, and then DSRM, which is directory services restore mode. So uh, the top feature here, uh, on the top of the page, it is forest function level. When you drop down this menu, there is 2012 R2, there is 2012, Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2008, R2 and 2008, right? So you're installing this server and uh, suppose this is a second domain controller in your environment uh, and uh, you're upgrading it to this level here, uh, 2016. Suppose that you're installing a domain controller or replica DC here, there's already a, why am I saying suppose, why don't I just create a diagram for that? Okay, so, um, here we need to understand a very crucial point here and that's another diagram that uh, you have uh, here uh, three sites or four sites here or maybe 200 sites here uh, you're a global company so Toronto branch again New York branch and again uh, London branch here um, okay so here uh, there is there are domain controllers here and they are 2008 based domain controllers. Suppose you have created a forest on 2008 base level and you're about to upgrade now these domain controllers, uh, the whole forest uh, to 2012, uh, 2016 actually. So either they are 2008 based uh, forests uh, or 2012. Suppose, okay, let's uh, put it on, you have already Windows 2012 here. Now this is an environment that you will see in uh, you know, uh, many companies. Suppose you have 2008 or Windows 2012. So root domain or uh, four years ago you created that forest or five years ago you created a forest and at that time Windows 2012 was there. So you created a forest of Windows 2012. Uh, right now we're installing 2016, right? So uh, then you have this replica DC of 2012, which is just a helper DC offering the same service which the root DC is offering. Always stick with the terminology here, root DC, the first ever DC, the rest are all replica DCs, which are just helping the root DC deliver the critical services like AAA, uh, NR, which is name resolution, uh, global catalog. There are many other services, but I just go for typical three uh, here. Uh, DHCP if you want to put that there. So suppose these, this is the environment, the only difference from our environment is that the first one is 2012 based, right? Then here in London you have domain controllers, but this is Windows 2008 DC, not a member server, DC. And then here you have also uh, Win 2008 member server, not a DC. So there is a concept to be understood uh, here. And then here you have Windows 2016 uh, DCs both. Okay, so now three branches have uh, different types of scenarios here. Uh, well, normally you will see this kind of scenario because uh, uh, you know the, this branch suppose you did not uh, upgrade anything 
and you're first going for this replica DC here uh, you install another DC apart from the 2012 DC and this is also 2012 let me just uh, make the picture clear then I'm gonna discuss again as well win 2012 this is also win 2012 one is the uh, root DC for the first ever DC that created the forest of 2012 second is just a helper DC for the root DC we understand that right and then the third one now you're actually you're telling the boss or the boss said uh, go ahead and you know we need a 2016 forest here forest environment so first you install a 2016 replica DC and it joins the uh, first you install a member server 2016 then you install uh, Active Directory on that it becomes a replica DC it also becomes a helper DC 2016 for the 2012 domain controllers it becomes a helper DC right replica DC just means helper or additional DC then later now the boss says hey go ahead this will be running the whole show from now on so on one weekend we plan that okay so we're gonna be transferring okay this is something that we haven't learned but uh, uh, you know the, one of the processes is you have to transfer the FISMO roles uh, from here which are five roles from 2012 to 2016 here we're gonna talk about that these are five roles that does unique jobs and those unique jobs can be done by any one domain controller multiple domain controllers cannot do those five uh, jobs uh, so FISMA roles first are transfer once FISMA roles are transferred this is the king of the jungle then this is the king right 2016 replica but you're about to do that and you're on this screen you're about to do that and you're on this screen uh, oh, not this screen this screen right and you say oh okay forest function level hey I'm gonna run the whole show I've transferred the FISMO roles already um, okay uh, I will go this way I'll just put the forest function level 2008 first of all what is forest function level 2008 forest function level are some of the for features that are implemented on the forest level like recycle bin recycle bin actually is the name of feature right recycle bin in active directory just means that that you uh, if you delete something uh, in active directory you can recover it in seconds right away for next 120 days that deleted object in active directory stays in deleted items area if recycle bin is there right recycle bin by default is disabled so in your environments if you have a recycle active directory recycle bin it's not recycle bin it's active directory recycle bin if you have enabled it that's a very good thing if you haven't enabled it now if you make a mistake in active directory and delete it you have to recover it from the backups if you have active directory recycle bin uh, enabled on the forest level you can recover active directory deleted accidentally deleted items right away in seconds for 120 days so suppose 120 days are passed and you forgot uh, user John it was deleted 120 days have passed so active directory recycle bin cannot help you recover that right away you have to then go to backups and restore from there so what I'm saying is active recycle bin is a forest wide feature there are many other forest wide features now you as a system administrator decide Oh, I'm gonna go to 2008 level here now why would you want to do that 2016 has more advanced forest level features why are you going back to 2008 level features here if I go back to the diagram here and the question is thrown to you now that why would I want to go for oh it's not diagram right it's the other one why do you want to go for you're upgrading a 2016 here and you say no 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 I'm gonna keep the forest function level to 2008 and remember this whole thing is a forest it's just one forest right now and you have three sites here and you can see 2008 domain controllers here 2016 domain controllers are here 2012 domain controllers are here but you're deciding uh, you're a smart admin and you're deciding Oh, forest level features. I know 2016 has introduced much better, much secure, very good forest level features. But I'm going to go back to 2008 forest level features because what could be the reason? If you see this diagram, and uh, you could guess something, we're still discussing here. It's not a test. We have a site with 2008 DC already, so in order to uh, backward compatibility, exactly as you guys said yes we have a 2008 domain controller here and 
it needs our forest needs a backward compatibility now what does that mean backward compatibility so what if i go for 2016 forest function level what will happen so if so suppose i go back here and select this oh i don't care so what if 2016 uh, 2008 is there and i go ahead and install the active directory with forest function level as 2016 what will happen 2008 server will not be able to communicate yes so now there is a very good point here and uh, a point that needs to be understood and that point is that if it's a domain controller it's going to be disconnected right away if it's a member server go ahead and make it 2016 forest function level it's not gonna affect member servers it's going to affect domain controllers right away so be careful if you have older d DCs the word is domain controller right if you have older DCs here uh, so you go for 2016 forest function level you have a 2012 DC here you have a 2012 replica DC here you have 2016 DC which is also okay which is just okay of course this is 2016 right but if you have older DCs don't then put your forest function level back to as older the DC is or upgrade this DC to a 2016 if you want to stick to forest function level upgrade all DCs to 2016 and then go ahead with forest function level of uh, 2016 if they are member servers it's okay you don't have to worry about the forest function level forest function level is all about you know backward compatibility with older servers domain controller older uh, domain controllers 2008 based domain controllers 2012 uh, based domain controllers right forest function level will discontinue them make them ineffective right away if they are older domain controllers and you have chosen a latest forest functional level you cannot do that but if it's a member server go ahead do that it will not affect any member server so we have to just keep that one main point in mind right but yeah what happens if someone still have the that's not even supported uh, so you cannot go ahead then 2016 as a forest function level suppose you have 2008 based forest it goes back to 2000 windows 2000 server so or suppose you have 2012 based forest then it doesn't go for 2003 it also goes to 2008 i think 2012 uh, no it also goes to 2008 so uh, if you have the, you know 2008 based forest it only supports 2003 so whoever has 2003 they must have a forest function level of 2008 already working and they cannot go ahead if they don't want to touch their 2003 domain controllers now for now right now 2003 uh, server has been uh, Microsoft has discontinued discontinued that support right four or five years ago so normally people would have a member server which is 2003 not a domain controller they would have a member server and second thing there is some legacy application that is really keeping their business up and the new version of that application is so expensive that the companies uh, decided no let's just keep this if it's alive 2003 we don't care if the Microsoft doesn't support it anymore and you're keeping it away from all the virus attacks and malware attacks but if they have 2003 they would most probably be member servers right now not domain controllers and they would go ahead to 2016 even they want because member servers are not affected domain controllers are affected so I'm sure that 2003 if they're there they're not domain controllers they are member servers uh, for any old application that is still running their business perfectly okay guys so uh, any question here that's one point we made yeah Forest function level. We have to upgrade because it's part of the same forest and it's a forest function level. So whichever sites or branches slash branches, whichever sites have older DCs, if you don't want to go back to the forest function level of that, please upgrade that. If you cannot upgrade that now, then don't go for for latest forest function level. You can upgrade it anytime. So which sites we upgrade first? Because if we upgrade this to 2016. So first, upgrade them as a 2016 replica DCs, right? 
So you can have a Windows 2012 based forest and you can still have a uh, newer version of operating system with a, as a replica DC as well, or additional domain controller as well. So if you really want domain controllers to be new, uh, you can easily just upgrade that first, then in the end start this forest function level uh, task. You can even go now with 2008 forest function. When I was selecting here in our lab, 2008, we can just go with that. Later, whenever we want, we can upgrade it to 2012, whenever we have upgraded all the branch DCs to latest ones, right? But once you upgrade, well, increase the level, you cannot decrease this back. It's not supported. So once you press 2016 and restart, that's it. Gone. You cannot put it back anymore. Yeah. So uh, which one? The last topic. Yeah. So if you went with the uh, forest function level, 2016 and then some branch administrator said hey my 2008 is not connecting and you say oops so it's too late so you cannot so once it uh, gets upgraded you cannot downgrade a forest function level or domain function level you cannot we, downgrade we have to upgrade the yes so first upgrade the domain controller if you cannot if it's not in your timeline right now that within next mm -hmm. weeks I cannot upgrade it I don't have the approvals to upgrade it they have some other priorities bosses right same for so 2012 as well. yeah same for 2012 as well so keep the forest function level to 2008 and create a 2016 forest it's still okay it's going to be backward compatible with all the 2008 domain controllers but whenever you have upgraded 2012 to 2016 and 2008 to 2016 whenever you did that maybe after six months you did that so then come back to 2016 uh, domain controller here and just uh, click the upgrade button to 2016 now i want the latest features of forest uh, so because all my domain controls are 2016 now, so you can upgrade that from 2008 forest function level to 2016 anytime you want. So later. Right now we are just discussing a production uh, environment scenario. Otherwise we're going for 2016. This scenario, this scenario, yeah, this is just a scenario that you could get in a production environment in a company. Yeah. So you're gonna keep the forest at 2008. Yes. And then. Or Later, yeah, we're gonna wait for the upgrades to happen whenever they upgrade. Suppose after one year they upgrade, so and the bosses say, No, no, we still want 2016. So then, uh, first up, uh, you know, put it on backward compatibility list, okay. put it on 2008. Whenever all the branches are upgraded to 2016, then go back to this server and upgrade it to 2016 for its functional level, whenever you want. Okay. So, but once it is there, you cannot put it back. Okay. That's the main thing, right. Now, yep. if the Fismo role is upgraded to 2016 without realizing that there's a one DC sitting in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, it is upgraded to 2016 already. For its function level. For its right? function level. Mm. Can you then, uh, w what is your option then? 2008 oh. needs to be completely rebuilt, rejoined, demoted. And all this? Okay. It has to be demoted. Uh, actually, it's not going to, de for demotion as well, it has to be communicating okay. with the so previous the domain the is probably the only You have to force force remove it. There's a force option as well. We're about to do that uh, uh, hopefully today. Uh, that we're going to install an Active Directory and replicate it, then we're going to remove it as well. Removal option, we need to know how to remove that. Pro so we'll properly demote it, but we cannot properly demote it if they, it is already disconnected from forest. Yeah? So just their side, not the whole forest? Just that side. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, we all understand that, right? The discussion we are doing, we all understand that, right? Yeah. The main thing is, are we understanding or not, right? Uh, and then the next most important thing is that we need to understand how to do it, right? So if this, that's the first uh, thing is that you cannot go ahead uh, without having a full inventory of your network. And suppose you have 200 branches, you're a smart admin, you will know, you ha will have an updated list always. You cannot miss this kind of thing, right? You cannot miss that how many domain you have and what type of domain you have. Uh, you must have third-party software, you have Excel sheet, and that's it. Go ahead and connect remotely and connect one by one to each domain controller. Domain controller's list comes in a Active Directory sites and services. I'm going to show you later. Active Directory yeah, users and computers in the domain controller's container. Anyway, it, it shows up. If it's a domain controller, it shows up in many areas. Anyway, guys, suppose I do this on forest functional level. So you can see on domain functional. You remember that Toronto has, so domain functional level also comes up with this, right? Options. But if I do this on forest function level, now domain function level does not support any of the previous backward uh, servers as well, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have older servers, 
go back to that forest function level if you go servers go domain controllers go back to 2008 go back to this level then every domain functional level will also support that so in uh, Toronto according to our diagram we have 2012 right in uh, uh, you know uh, that New York diagram we have 2016 so I'm gonna on New York domain function level uh, domain function level I will have because I have latest domain controllers there I'm gonna go for oh I need fun uh, you know latest features on domain level at least right but uh, in London I have 2008 domain controllers so the, in London domain function level I will have 2008 like this but I can choose all the domain function level because uh, the top function level is backward compatible right now so you can on different domains you can choose according to whatever domain controllers you have if you have any of the uh, older domain controllers go for that if you have any of the this go for that right so it depends uh, on what is your domain controller population which branch has what which domain has what right suppose you have five child domains there uh, two three domains there and they have different domain controllers right now and it will be like that many companies uh, will you will see many branches will be like that so some administrators have very strict policies they always go with plans especially banks uh, you will see that uh, they when you go with a plan you must keep that level same of whatever edition version you are using for domain controllers unless there's a business application that really wants that specific type of domain controller uh, to be with specific editions and version. Yeah. For the domain function level, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we change it to 2016, yep. and we're still uh, maintaining the forest function level in 2008, yep. and later when we change it to 2016, does yep. that give us any additional feature or no, that's it. functionality? Forest, uh, forest function level, if it changes to 2016, so yeah. forest level features will be available for everyone actually. Right. But specifically, if you had 2016 already there, it's not going to add anything new to that domain exactly. level. It's just because of a mix and match uh, exactly. architecture of domain control functional level. Yeah, exactly. You're right. So, guys, do we understand this? <coughs> right? Backward compatibility, you have to be very careful about, and it could be one oops and fired. After oops is fired, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> that could be a deadly oops for the job. So uh, normally uh, on this level in large organizations, you have a very good plan. Take your time planning, right? Don't execute it right away. Take your time. Okay, uh, so 2016 here, we need to understand all the new features. So of course we don't have that issue, but we know that if there were a member server, according to the diagram, we would still go for that. If there are any domain controller, then we will be careful. If there's an older domain controller, member servers, it's okay, you can go ahead. So we understand that, right? Now, what is the purpose with the DNS? Of course, we need DNS uh, windows, yep. Why is it okay to go with the member server? Uh, no, it's the uh, domain controller has, domain controllers has connectivity and feature compatibility with each other. So older domain controllers and latest features sometimes are not compatible. So you're installing latest features on the top level and the domain controllers down there does not even know what that feature is and they're not compatible. 2008 does not know what are the new features right. coming in 2016. So that's why they will be disconnected right away because there will be no compatibility between them. So you have to go on the top level and use those features which in their time they understood that feature on the forest level. So on forest level you need to implement something 2016, 2008 has no idea what that is. So it's going to only make corruption in the forest. So that's why member servers have nothing to do with uh, Active Directory, you know, AAA, Global Catalog Services. Member servers are just simple servers that can host an enterprise application on oh, top of it. Yeah. yeah. So, okay guys, uh, here, DNS, uh, of course, uh, we want to have name-based access to every network resource, right? So DNS, of course, is the most important. Suppose your Active Directory is perfectly configured and your DNS has an issue, of course, automatically your Active Directory will have an issue. Suppose your uh, exchange server is perfectly working with uh, 14,000 or 20,000 mailboxes there and your DNS has an issue, your exchange server also has an issue now. So whatever application in uh, uh, enterprise you've uh, introduced and DNS has an issue, all those applications will have, will have that issue as well. So DNS is very, very important, right? Why is there an option, if it is so critical, why is there an option to uncheck it as well? Don't uncheck it, I'm just asking. If it's that critical, just like GC is critical, so why isn't it grayed out here? Because 
It might not be installing the, the DNS functionality on that specific server. Uh, DNS might be on a primary mm. something. Exactly. DNS might already be somewhere else. So you can install independent DNS okay. anywhere else as well. That's why you can uncheck here. I don't want to install DNS here on this server because I already have it somewhere else, right? Then there's an option. Otherwise, it's so critical that it should be grayed out. But if you have a DNS somewhere else, then there is an option. But in our case, we're going to let Active Directory install the DNS role and configure the forward lookup zone portion of the DNS zone. Now, what is forward lookup zone? What is backward, uh, backward, uh, you know, uh, backward uh, lookup zone? So we're gonna just try to check that, right? Uh, it's not backward, it's reverse lookup zone. Seriously, what's wrong with me? Okay, so backward lookup zone. Okay, anyway, uh, so DNS, we're gonna install that. We're gonna open the DNS console. And then we're going to go inside and check everything. Uh, what is DNS? Uh, what are the best practices for that? But uh, so DNS is inst getting installed. We can install it ourselves, but better let Active Directory do the installation for us and configure the forward lookup zone at least, right? So uh, the one liner for that is it resolves host names to IP addresses and IP addresses to host names, right? That's the one liner for DNS. But we're going to talk about that later as well in detail. Global catalog server, what does that do? So DNS does name resolution, we understand that. Global catalog server does two things, and I will be asking that again and again from you. Uh, so just try to memorize that. Uh, global catalog server uh, does two things, which are forest-wide search and use of logon. So I'm just gonna write that down. So uh, here, so GC equals global catalog uh, server, but global catalog. So global means across the forest, uh, across the whole network, and catalog is a list or uh, you know list of uh, all the objects in the forest. Uh, so here, uh, it helps do uh, forest wide search. Uh, it helps with user logon. Third thing, uh, now it's not a third thing; it's just a definition. Uh, of uh, GC as well. Uh, it contains partial information of all the objects in the forest. Okay, it contains partial information of all the objects in the forest, right? So, main thing, if you're sitting in London branch and you're looking for a printer in Toronto, so you just, uh, user would just try to search uh, PRT Tor PRT one, suppose that's the name of the Toronto printer. So user would search that, uh, make that search, and suppose user is uh, in London, right? Mm -hmm. So you have here, I, I've uh, you know already added that GC, so when you install domain controller, first domain controller GC has to be there, it's compulsory. Forest wide, there has to be one global catalog server, it has to be at least having one global catalog server, right? So second, you have an option now. Second domain controller, do you want GC to be there as well? If you have two domain controllers, then the request for searching of any objects can be load balanced between the two, right? Maybe uh, someone is searching printers, maybe someone is searching servers, someone is searching something else. So the request will be divided among the two servers, right? Suppose you don't have a GC in London and uh, you install a directory, but you uh, opted to not install global catalog server. So a London user tries, suppose user John is in London, and he's trying to search for a printer in Toronto. How, what will happen now? He does the search and it will go over the van to the nearest GC and it GC will uh, you know, put that information. Oh yeah, I know that, where is the printer? And the van, uh, uh, it will give an answer. Then the user will be connecting to that uh, printer. So how much traffic have you generated because you did not install global catalog server on a local site, right? That's one user. And we're saying that there are 5,000 users here. So that's all huge traffic you're creating over the van because we did not introduce a global catalog server on the local site. So whenever you have, Microsoft always recommend that localization of services. What does that mean? You need to have critical services locally available, right? So have GC available here. So users request should not travel over the van. Do not create extra van traffic. As much as you can avoid, try to avoid it. Make those services locally available. So global catalog server uh, can do local uh, user logon as well as forest-wide search. 
and it contains partial information of all the objects in the forest. So user want to search a New York printer, user want to search a Toronto printer, Toronto user want to search something in New York. As long as they are part of the forest, you can make all kinds of searches and find that object, right? So uh, the global catalog, right? Now, um, here, once uh, this is done, do we understand global catalog? Forest right search, user logon. Always remember that. Just keep three, these few words in your mind. Memorize them, right? Forest right search, user logon. I'm going to ask you in next classes because you should know that, remember that, right? Once this is done, let's go ahead. And uh, global catalog server, you know, it's, it's so uh, crucial. One global catalog server per forest has to be there. Microsoft says best practices go for two domain controllers if you have two domain controllers suppose you have 10 domain controllers at least you know uh, all can have the global catalog services because if you have 10 domain controllers this means maybe you have 50,000 users that's why you have 10 domain controllers right maybe you have that kind of population of users so that is a lot of search traffic that coming your way from 50,000 users right so you know if every domain controller has a global catalog server that's also okay so in a LAN you must have you know good Ethernet <laughs> network connection right what is read-only domain controller? So, RODC, read-only domain controller. So, domain controllers are whatever we uh, I put in the diagram here are read and write domain controllers. Read and write domain controllers. So, read-only domain controllers are used for uh, secure, you know, those branches which are kind of remote and does not have network security so you put their RODCs or read only domain controllers but what you will be amazed with is uh, you know if you follow that concept of any level of security is less security you never are content with your current security because anyone can reach you with your best security right and this is so much often right now you know there are so many companies there and they normally know after two years, three years, oh, we were being hacked for last two years. Wow, what a statement. Mm -hmm. So maybe your company right now, somebody's visiting from outside and checking your files. Oh, wow, this I can sell to their rivals now. Cool. That would fetch me like $10,000. So, and he comes, uh, he or she comes in and that for the next last three years, four years, somebody's coming from outside and hacking your network and you have no idea, right? Any security is less security so never be content with your current security whatever latest state-of-the-art security you have right keep an eye on that and think that you're not secure you know uh, so then you will come up with okay what else what else? or just learn ethical hacking and try to hack your network from outside try to learn all the latest techniques and many students are doing ethical hacking and they are actually considered better for big companies that oh you've done ethical hacking course as well cool so you know all the loopholes in our network. So okay, and so one of my uh, students' friends, uh, students that uh, that his cousin went to U.S. for security uh, related uh, lecture. So his teacher was an ethical hacker, and he was in handcuffs, and his legs were also handcuffed or leg cuffed. Maybe that's a word for that. But he was one of the top-notch hackers, and he was teaching them ethical hacking with handcuffs. Uh, so <laughs> he was that good hacker, right? They hire them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hackers. Exactly. They need that talent. Yeah. So he was really handcuffed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. handcuffed. So he would run but away and uh, he, yeah, by the actually some other organization. <laughs> so he was teaching. So they may have done a bargain that okay, if you teach these guys. Uh, we will just put your lesser years instead of 12 years, we're going to be 8 years here. So yeah. he's giving his talent to others. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Yeah. There are colleges that are teaching how to hack Facebook now. So there is no guarantee how ethical we will be later. <laughs> so, <laughs> But you have to stay ethical. But if you do that course, your value in the uh, organization is, in the industry is good. Yeah, so they know then your background. Uh, they do a criminal background check, right? Yeah, yeah. So if any company has already, you know, seen your name somewhere, you're out of North America and Europe. You 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 cannot be hired anywhere. 
So you're gonna destroy your future just for by one hack, one illegal attempt. So be an ethical hacker. Try to tell them, explore, you know, explain them your skills. Anyway, RODC you can put in remote branches, but banks use with their so unlimited budgets and big branches having just state of the art security. They still put RODCs there, read-only domain controllers. That's another security, right? So with read-only domain controllers, first of all, we cannot modify anything inside Active Directory. Second thing, it does not locally contain password hashes. There are no passwords stored locally inside read-only domain controllers. Only read and write domain controllers have the passwords. So a hacker hacks read and write domain controllers, he can, he or she can get a password for any, you know, your CEO, your directors, your managers, right? So read only domain controllers, it does not contain password hashes. So this means if the RODC does not have password hashes locally stored, RODC also cannot authenticate users. It cannot authenticate users as well. So this means RODC, uh, RODC cannot do AAA, it can do AA, which means it cannot do authentication, but it can do authorization and accounting. So authentication is the main critical one, which requires that what is your password? Authorization does not. Accounting does not. Authenticate, you have to get authenticated and then you're in the system and Kerberos works in such a way that, uh, you know, you get that uh, authorization for all those. So we're gonna talk about Kerberos in, you know, most probably next class. I'm gonna run the video, seven minute video. You have to go through that video to understand. It explains very well in a very, you know, uh, easy way. What is Kerberos? If mm -hmm. you're not having a password, how do you get into the system? Uh, so, uh, if you suppose this RODC was deployed here, this mean here, this is RODC. So, what happens? The user logon request comes, and the request uh, goes uh, is received to the RODC. It connects to the regional nearest read and write domain controller. That's a lot of WAN traffic. Suppose you have 200 users here. Suppose you have 20 users here in this branch. Mm -hmm. So, it is going to forward that, but. When we do the RODC lab, we're gonna see that we can choose which users, user yeah, password hashes can be stored locally as oh, well. Okay. Only those 20 users, exactly. only those 200 users. We can add there, yeah, except. So if the hacker attacks that RODC, yes, those 20 users passwords will be compromised. So try to not add them to any other critical security groups or critical network resources or shared folders, right? So RODC, you have to be careful about how do you deploy that. So here, RDC, uh, we understand now that uh, it is read-only domain controller. It, you cannot modify anything in Active Directory in RODC, or, uh, and also it does not authenticate. It can authorize, it can uh, uh, do accounting and auditing, it cannot authenticate you. It does not contain your passwords, password hashes. So it, has, uh, it doesn't have your authentication information, right? So uh, it will not do authentication, so this means your authentication will travel over the van. You better have a good van connection. Okay, we understand RODC briefly, but we're going to do the lab as well. So, let's go ahead, right? Okay, here, so we're still on this page. We talked about uh, forest functional level, we talked about domain functional level, and uh, we talked about its uh, implications if you decide, uh, you know, not according to your uh, factual, uh, you know, information. And uh, so DNS, yes, we need that. That's why it's selected. Global catalog, it is uh, required. One global catalog per forest is required. So it is selected and grayed out. You cannot make a change here. And then RODC, the first domain controller cannot be an RODC, obviously. You must need to have one read and write domain controller first. Mm -hmm. And then second or third, you can create an RODC, right? Now, what is this directory services restore mode here, DSRM? Um, and why it has a pass. First of all, when do you restore? What is restore related to? Exactly. So it normally it's related to backups. Yeah, mm -hmm. backups. backups. So you do a backup in your company. What is the routine of backup? Weekdays, incremental, and uh, weekends, full backups, right? Normally that's the detail, routine for uh, everyone. And uh, incremental backups run in the evening, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Some companies run twice a day incremental backups as well. So, um, you know, uh, so those backups will be needed 
if somehow Active Directory is messed up, Active Directory has crashed. So you're going to go to Directory Services Restore Mode. And how do you go there? You have to restart the domain controller. And you have to press F8. It will go to Directory Services Restore Mode. And then you have to do Authoritative Restore. We're going to do the whole lap. I'm going to understand each and every option there. Why do we do that and why do we don't do that? But the main thing about this is Directory Services Restore Mode. That you, if you need to restore uh, directory services or Active Directory from backup, you have to go to this area and do that. And why do you want to put a password here? Do a restore. Or company rights. Yeah. Somebody don't mess up your backup. Exactly. So suppose you're, uh, I'm a junior admin, you're a senior admin, mm -hmm. and I want your position, and you're on, you know, vacation. So I'm just gonna go for. 10 year old restore tapes there. I'm gonna take out those tapes. And I know your account password. I'll just log in from your account. And uh, well, this is a separate account. So you cannot, it cannot log in. You have to log, log in from that uh, local account here. And still, you know, you restore 10 years old uh, backup. And that's it. Your company goes 10 years back in terms of Active Directory. And you're fired as a system administrator. And I become system administrator. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. Come on. Okay. So, okay, guys. Uh, so here, uh, directory services restore mode definitely it should be password protected we are giving class password but in production environment it has to be a different difficult password right so you have to maintain in production environments normally 10 to 15 passwords right and just put it in very secure place like Twitter or Facebook right <laughs> oh okay last pause. Uh -huh. last last, pause. last <laughs> Uh, so you mean you need a break or something? No, no, no. There's an application. They, they do good in the last pause. Okay, last pause. Sorry. I thought they had, uh, just paused for the class. Uh, last pause. It's, it's online, so that's just Well, good. people have been doing many stranger things. Uh, so I wherever you feel secure and confident, as long as they are not out, you're good. Whatever you can use. The thing is, <laughs> it should not be out. Once it is out, then you realize, oh, it was not secure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because the last pass is on the cloud. So. Oh. Cloud, there are many services. Many of my colleagues uh, have been using many very, very secure cloud services. But uh, it's your confident on that. Confidence on that. Definitely. So, guys, uh, some of the administrators are using. Uh, so, uh, okay, guys, uh, we put the class password, which is small ABC, capital ABC, shift one to three. <laughs> Small ABC, capital ABC, shift one to three. Key pressing shift one to three. Okay, so. Uh, if you, you can remember, yes. So please do remember whatever password you're using. Uh, please do not lock yourself out because we're going to do that live direct services. So um, that's why we're sticking to class password. Oh, yeah, I didn't tell the class password. It's small ABC, capital ABC, shift one to three. Or I'm too fast right now. So it's uh, this, and uh, small ABC, capital ABC, keep pressing shift, one, two, three, this one. Uh, this is class password, we call it. It's just, uh, you know, everywhere where it asks for a password, just put one password here. Because some students lock themselves out, and then, you know, they have to redo the lab, that lab. Or if you had the snapshot, that snapshot may not have Active Directory installed, so you will have to redo the whole thing again. Uh, if we lock, uh, so we all have exactly the same password for any screen in production environment. Definitely, we need to have different passwords. All right, so okay, guys, let's go ahead. Uh, this is a class password. Please always use that everywhere, in, wherever it asks for a password, but do not use it for Gmail, Hotmail. One student was saying he's using that. He's so used to it now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's click next. Uh, previous. Did you put the correct password there? Is it so just to remove the both passwords and we need a break. We haven't installed Active Directory yet. Oh, okay. So uh, two more pages, and then when it restarts, let's have a break. Right at that time. So just two more pages, and I'm going to discuss each page one hour. No, just kidding. It's uh, next things are not that long. There. Oh, cool. So, welcome. Everyone uh, on this page? So, okay. click next. And, uh, well, it is saying right now it is looking for a DNS and it's not able to find because we're in the process of installing a DNS, so we can safely ignore that. 
Oh, and there is no option here anyway to do anything here, right? So we are in the process of installing DNS. So definitely it's not gonna find a DNS uh, parent zone here and because we are installing it, right? So ignore that and click next. Now this screen, uh, verify the NetBIOS name assigned to the domain and change it if necessary. So NetBIOS domain name is just domain's first name. So NetPlus, do, NetPlus domain dot local, that's our domain name, right? So it's giving us just the first name. So some of the legacy applications, some of the enterprise applications, uh, maybe older applications that were programmed to access directory services with single name. Microsoft says since 2000 uh, that you have to use our format, which is something dot something, prefix dot suffix, right? So it has to be something dot something dot something. So all uh, application vendors who are making banking applications, hospital applications, uh, or uh, you know insurance applications, so they need sometimes or majority of the time they need to connect to Active Directory to retrieve user information, import those users in hospital application or insurance application, right? So they need to connect to Active Directory to get latest information. Oh, there are 200 more users. Okay, let me retrieve those 200 users as well. So. Uh, many applications have followed Microsoft uh, protocol that uh, okay if it's net plus domain dot local so we're gonna co put the application to connect to Active Directory with s any name that has something dot something dot something dot something it's okay applications are compatible with that naming format but some applications older applications were programmed oh you're gonna connect to directory services and it's gonna be just single name the programmers did not developers did not program that application to access the directory services with uh, a name that has a format of something dot something. So if they see something dot something and they cannot connect, there's an error, developer says, okay, we're gonna charge you just half a million more dollar, or oh, that's kidding, maybe $50,000 more or $20,000 more because you're a large organization, you're making money. So uh, we deserve some of the portion. So anyway, they will say that, oh, we're going to do that uh, format compatible compatibility in this much. So company says, no way, come on, we're not giving you that much. So they went to Microsoft, hey, come on Microsoft, can you just make it single name access uh, Active Directory as well? So also you can join the PCs to domain with a single name, which is not recommended. Always use the full domain name there when you're joining a computer to a domain. But anyway, applications, legacy applications, and some newer applications also are programmed to access Active Directory with a single name instead of the dot something, dot something format. So Microsoft says, yes, go ahead, just use uh, the first name of the domain and you can still access our Active Directory. Don't worry about those expensive applications that are not compatible. They are compatible. They can access our directory services, retrieve information with a single name as well. Right? Do we understand that? Mm -hmm. Do we? So enterprise applications can access Active Directory with single name as well. They don't have to strictly follow netplus domain dot local or New York dot netplus domain dot local or downtown dot New York dot netplus domain dot local. If they don't support that, it's okay. Just give one name and they still will be able to connect to Active Directory. Okay, guys, so once uh, we don't have to make any changes here, but you, if you want to make a change, uh, uh, you know, in a production environment, if the company says, no, 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 we're going to give a different name here. So you, they can, but we're not going to change anything. The main thing is, are we understanding what is the purpose of this page? We do, right? We have to understand. So, okay, guys, next. And please make your notes, summarize notes. Uh, this discussion is very, very important. Next, next finish is not the purpose of these classes, right? Next, next finish you can follow from YouTube as well, right? Any kid can do that. So the main thing is, do we understand what's happening in the background, right? That's the main thing. Okay, guys. So here, uh, database folder, log file folder for the active directory. This is the path. Of course, it's the most crit uh, critical path here. And uh, inside C drive, inside Windows, uh, inside NTDS folder, you have the database folder of Active Directory, which is, uh, anyone knows what is the file name of Active Directory itself, the database file itself? It is ntds.dit, D-I-T. So that's the actual file name of the Active Directory, ntds.dit, dit, ntds.dit. So anyway, that file, we will, once we install Active Directory, we're gonna to go to that uh, area and we're gonna check that if entities.data is there or not. Log files will be created and they will uh, check all the events, whatever, whenever Active Directory had any major event going on like uh, crashing or restarting. Syswall folder, very important here. Uh, the only purpose of a syswall folder is, let me just quickly write that down. Well, that's too messy now. Okay. 
But in one picture, you get to have all the definitions, right? Well, shall I just push it? Hey, I can do that. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Okay, guys. So here it is. Uh, Syswald. Please memorize it. All the previous definitions as well. Because you need to have one single line to be able to explain some basic concept about that. So the only thing is that it is a repository and launching area for uh, group policies and scripts. So policies. Oh, that's a new word. Okay, policies. And uh, so it is a repository and launching area for group policies and scripts. What does that mean? Uh, so all the group policies and uh, uh, example of a group policy was that if you block USB uh, that policy when you enable that policy is, lives literally inside syswall it is created it uh, one folder is created for that policy inside a syswall folder we're gonna visit that when we go for group policies so syswall folder is that folder it is a shared folder uh, it is a shared folder on our domain controller right now, the only purpose of that is if you want to implement uh, block USB group policy on 10,000 users, uh, if, when you create that policy, it gets created inside syswall folder, right? If you remove that syswall folder, you cannot implement group policies. So you cannot maintain or uh, you know con uh, control your whole domain without group policies. There are 2,000 plus group policies and you can just block any portion you can block run you can block control panel you can block display settings you can keep on block anything you want right just to keep your environment secure and productive so if syswall folder does not survive your group policy cannot get implemented on thousands of users and computers so it's very very critical that syswall folder is properly configured and it survives right so we understand the purpose of syswall folder that group policies gets uh, implemented through syswall folder and scripts as well, right? Okay. Uh, oh, uh, a group of the scripts uh, to be implemented on users and slash bar computers. Okay. Now it explains because they are meant for users and or computers, right? Either users or computers, or you know, we can have both. So we're gonna do that uh, group policy thing. Uh, we're gonna spend a lab doing that. And now we read the final part, woohoo. Okay, right, okay, nobody excited, okay. <laughs> it's like, come on teach, it's Monday night. Already we, 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 we couldn't, you know, Monday night who sleeps on Sunday night, right? So it's, everyone's like, ah, oh, Monday morning, oh, I cannot open my eyes. So, yeah, we need coffee, you're right. So uh, this is very important, syswall folder here. It gets created. We're gonna get a proof for that as well next. And there you go, the summary. Do not go ahead, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. One more thing, view script. <laughs> Abubakar is like, oh, where is that core, you know, hot coffee, I'm gonna pour, you know, just put everything on him. Okay, view script, the last button here, view script. If you click the view script, it is a PowerShell script that has accepted all that has uh, recorded all your answers or options that you have selected in the whole uh, wizard now it has created a partial script with that and now in uh, suppose you create a new member server and you create want to create it as a replica dc you can use this powershell script with these answers here uh, and uh, it will be an unattended installation of uh, active directory in that member server so this is a partial script with the help of which you can install Active Directory without there. So run the script, install, restart, done. You don't have to click, 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 and choose those answers. No this, no that. Those, those. That's for replica. Replica DC. So this is a partial script that's gonna do it for you. So later I'm gonna give you an assignment for that. Go do that, but not now. Okay, but we need to know that view script means what, right? It is. It has recorded all your answers. And it is a partial script that with which you can install a, a replica DC. Okay, next. Now it's going to verify prerequisites here for domain controller operation, and and then uh, it's going to show two warnings here. First warning is about that if you still have uh, see these warnings. Suppose it's coming to you, but I'm just explaining it now. 
that uh, uh, first of all first warning says if you still have windows 94.0 first of all you should leave the it field forever mm -hmm. no just kidding okay. so if you have windows 94.0 then it's not going to securely communicate with your 2016 domain controller this is the same warning that comes in 2012 when you install active directory and 2008 as well so they are still giving you warning they still think somebody has 94.0 seriously what's wrong with you microsoft okay Anyway, uh, a delegation for this DNS, this is the same warning that, hey, I could not find a DNS record here because we're in the process of installing DNS, that's why. So we can ignore both these warnings here. And it says prerequisites, check complete, all prerequisite checks passed successfully. Go ahead, click install and have a break. And you can do <sighs> like that too, it's okay. Well, whenever you need, click install, whoever has click install can take a break now. You know. Who's gonna go out? I think everybody yeah, it's a lockdown fault right now. So, hey, we should have a remote and camera here. Click and camera. Click. Camera. Yeah. Error. You are kidding me. Really? Oh, you did not give static IP there. Check your network card with static IP. Pausing now. You want. Uh, okay, guys, so we are back from the break, and uh, I think everyone's screen is like this, not this. Okay. Uh, let me just connect it, and then I'm, ask, I'm going to ask again. Uh, like this. Yes. So please go ahead and log in, and let's just go for the proof of Active Directory. So we're going to visit some areas here. If you are, oh, everyone's on the screen, right? Or logged in, right? Okay. Cool. So I'm just going to quickly log in here, and we are using Domain Administrator. This was in a standalone server. It was a local administrator. Now that username is domain administrator. So it has, a, we can say it's a king of the jungle or it has all the privileges to do anything across the forest because it has enterprise uh, uh, and schema admin memberships there. Oh, okay. So this is the end of our course uh, class here. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay. Yeah, just kidding. So, um, and uh, let's just go ahead and. Uh, so we have, we've logged in from Active Directory, guys. If you all have logged in, have you all logged in? All right. So if you have logged in here, so what's the proof that this is a domain controller? Domain it, is? it is? Yeah, where is it? How do I go there? It's a standalone server. I, I say it's a standalone server. Prove it's a domain controller. Where do I go first? Okay, where? So first of all, ADDS is there, right? First of all, second thing is, if you go to tools, yeah, you see, tools, you can see Active Directory related stuff here now, links there. Second thing, right? Everyone sees that? It's the domain controller, right? Active, but these could be RSAT tools as well. When you uninstall Active Directory, after that, when you restart uh, that uh, server, so if it's a replica DC and we're, we're uninstalling Active Directory, and then you restart, still these links appear. So that is not a proof that it's a domain controller, right? Right now we know it's a domain controller because we installed it, but normally these are RSAT tools. These links come from uh, when you install RSAT, right? Remote uh, Server Administration Tools. But if we all see this, do we all see that, no. right? Okay, so uh, click Tools. Okay. You there? You can see that, right? Active Directory related stuff. So guys, Third proof that is it a domain controller or not? So, third proof, are we there? Yeah, no. Okay, which one? You can go ahead, sir. Okay, cool. Okay, guys, so third one is do you do we see a yellow folder or the file explorer here? Click the yellow folder or the file explorer, and then do we see on the left side this PC? Go ahead with this PC on the left side. And then we go to C drive, C drive, and then we can go to Windows folder. Everyone sees the Windows folder? Mm -hmm. If I'm going fast, let me know so I can go faster. No, just kidding. Uh, slower. So Windows, double click that. Once you're inside the C drive on server one and Windows folder, so just single click anywhere here, single click, and type the word N. So single click anywhere and type the word N. N and you should be getting NTDS. So uh, 
if you this entity as we just talked about before the break that this is the path where active directory files are so let's go inside entity as now i hope everyone got it so double click that and these are just the, all the files log files and check file and uh, then you see ntds.dit that's the actual database file for the active directory if any hacker gets a uh, hold of this file all your passwords are cracked gone so you need to well the right now it is being used so uh, the hackers cannot connect any application there there is a method to actually export that file this is not an ethical hacking class anyway yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, IFM is one option, uh, you know, installed for media, where if you put some commands, you can export the whole Active Directory and put it in a USB stick. And in a copy paste? Right now, uh, so copy paste, uh, it's not going to uh, full transfer all the files there. It's going to have, it will be a corrupted file. And, okay guys, uh, so here, if, when you uninstall Active Directory, first thing that happens is this NTDS folder is gone from there. So you might have the, these links here still after the uninstallation of Active Directory because this is just our set tools uh, that are showing those links. But if you don't have NTDS folder there, this means it's not a domain controller. If you have an NTDS folder, this means it's a domain controller uh, with this NTDS.dit file. And uh, any hacker could just uh, you know write a script that searches for this path here. So normally uh, you may want to change that path as well in a production environment according to the best practices. But I would just uh, go to technet.ca which is the Microsoft uh, uh, site and put their uh, best practices for Active Directory paths. And whatever suggestions are there, I would just follow that. So normally users, hackers would just go for ndds.dit file there, right? So that's one, uh, the third proof here. First proof, okay, ADDS, ADDS is uh, uh, as a role installed on the left side. DNS is installed as a role on the left side. Then second thing is tools is there. Then third thing is that folder is there. Then the fourth <coughs> thing is, so if we, uh, I've uh, checked here, but uh, on the back, you can just click anywhere here on the left side and you're back on server manager. Everyone is back on server manager? So, okay, and, oh. So just, uh, you know, we can close the folder here, this one. Just go ahead and close the folder. Uh, this folder, and now you should be back on server manager. Yes, server manager. Okay, so do we all see this Windows icon on the left side here? This Windows icon where my mouse is shivering right now? Not with cold? Okay, so right click on this, and do you see run here? Do, you, do we all see run? So click the run here, and then type, you know, we want to just see the shared folders of the server, right? So what do we type? Backslash, backslash, which means go to the network, and server01 is the name, or if you don't have this name, just put the IP. 192.168.1.1, it's the same thing. It's going to just show us the shared folders of this current server, right? So uh, I've just put a name, you can just put an IP here as well, and it's gonna do the same thing. It's backslash backslash tilted towards the left side. It's not slash slash or forward slash, which is tilted towards your right side. So, so it's backside. These folders are shared for like, let's say if we have a you know, automation unit or we have an HR department, we have IT department, and we have an IT department. So we can make different shared folders. Exactly. So shared folders normally does that. Yeah, that you want to share some uh, files, files there. You put it on shared folder so others on the network can access that shared folder, see that folder and. Uh, access okay. files. It created a, two shared folders there. One is log on, uh, and the second is uh, that syswall. Can you create now? Like after creating we can create as many shared folders as we want. Yeah. Are you gonna yeah, that's a full lab coming okay. for uh, file servers. At that time, we're going to create a lot of shared folders okay. and access that as well. Okay. Yep. Oh. Was it shared like by default or? It's by default. So if I press OK now, go ahead and press OK if uh, anyone has not. So you should be seeing this now, net logon and syswall. These are created by default. This is a domain controller and this is the proof that it's a domain controller. Syswall folder is always shared because through that group policies have to be uh, going to the network to be uh, implemented on all the users and computers, right? So syswall has to be there, shared folder, as a shared folder. Domain controllers normally have these two shared folders, right? But uh, well, uh, it's, you know, I have to see a best practice that if we want to rename it or we can hide the share, yes, we can do that. 
but uh, you know they're shared but they cannot be seen that's another advanced feature right just put dollar sign in front of it, it they're hidden now they can be hidden okay guys so uh, this is the fourth one here yep yeah these are default administrative folders so normally we don't know that's why I was saying that I have to go to TechNet site and check that is that a best practice can we do that even is it uh, good to do that or not because they're automatically being used by Active Directory and other domain controllers to be communicating with each other yes exactly but after that definitely it's, it may not be a best practice you're right exactly okay right, guys so let's close that we have seen uh, four or five areas here uh, for domain controller uh, proof so let's go ahead and uh, try to open our, uh, you know, uh, go to tools and the day-to-day -to -day jobs that we're gonna do is inside users and computers here, right? Although all these links are there, domains and trusts we're gonna be using for creating uh, forest trust, creating, uh, uh, and uh, going to follow up with the uh, child domains when we create that and, uh, you know, those three domain we create that. And module for PowerShell, of course, uh, with PowerShell you can do all activity tasks there and sites and services for the checking how many domain controls we have and how many sites we have, right? But we're gonna go for Active Directory users and computers. That's where we do day-to-day -day tasks mostly. So click the Active Directory users and computers here. So here in Active Directory users and computers, uh, if everyone has opened that, then you can expand this netplusdomain.local here. Now there are built-in folders here, containers or folders, you can say containers mainly. Uh, computers container, domain controls container, foreign security principles container, managed services account, service accounts, and users, right? So uh, you can see in built-in container and users container that they are already populated. Uh, the rest, uh, you know, domain controllers container is also populated because we just have one server that has Active Directory. So whichever server has Active Directory uh, is a domain controller and all domain controllers always show up inside the domain controllers container automatically so if you have a client machine like windows server 7 windows 8 windows 10 or if you have a member server of course member server means that active directory is not installed so they will all show up inside the computers container here if you install any of the member server active directory they're going to show up start showing up here right we haven't joined the server to the domain so that's why it's not showing here we're going to join that uh, so built-in if you go to built-in here that's where the Microsoft has created all the security groups and it can you, you see here security groups uh, uh, you know so these are the security groups that have special privileges already given so if it is account operators so that uh, whoever becomes a member of this security group will be uh, only be able to handle accounts uh, and whoever is part of the backup operator security group they will only be able to do backup and restore and uh, certificate services or cryptographic operators for security and for uh, giving certificate files. So it all goes on to event log readers. They can just read event logs. So all security groups are created, which are built in, and any member who gets added uh, will get those specific privileges. We don't give those privileges. Microsoft has already carefully given those privileges uh, that it cannot do anything else, but it can do at least those specific tasks here that the group was made up for. So it does explain here on the right side uh, description that what each group does uh, here, right? So we these are all security groups that are already created and the top most, uh, uh, you know, the most dangerous one is, one of the dangerous ones is administrator, administrators group, uh, domain admins group, enterprise admins group, and others, right? So uh, guys, uh, well, once this is done, uh, let's just go ahead and try to uh, do, uh, so let's just uh, click uh, close here from Active Directory using computers. Are you, can you tell me? Uh, yeah, sure. How you open a window? Sorry? Uh, how you open a window? Oh, okay. Here, tools and Active Directory users and computers. So then we did the whole introduction for that, all the folders, right? So, all right, guys, uh, now DNS. We're going to be doing a lot of tasks on Active Directory, but there is a very, very crucial role that is uh, that got installed uh, aside from uh, the Active Directory domain services. So DNS is a separate role. Active Directory domain services is a separate role, right? Because Active Directory totally depends on DNS, so DNS was installed right away. 
Uh, now, one thing about it is that we need to uh, follow a best practice here where we need to see the FQDN of our DNS server. Now, what does that mean? What did I just said? FQDN? Huh? What is that? So, guys, are we still on this server, server 1? Yes. So, uh, we can go down to this Windows icon here and right click that Windows icon so we could see these options here. And do we all see command prompt admin? Yeah, right, okay. So click the command prompt admin, command prompt admin here. Now we should be seeing this command prompt with administrator written here, right? It opens in Windows and System32. So uh, what we need to do is there's a command called uh, nslookup. There's a file called nslookup. ns means name server, lookup means just go search for it. So when we type nslookup, so we are trying to ask the fully qualified domain name of our DNS server. Suppose you have 10,000 machines in your network, every machine's IP preferred DNS would be 200.1 because on this machine we installed a DNS role, right? So from any of the 10,000 machines, if you log in and uh, try to type NSLOOKUP, it should give you a correct FQDN, fully qualified domain name. FQDN is fully qualified domain name. Fully qualified domain name. What that means is, a server name and the domain name. So a server name and a full domain name should be there. And the correct IP address should be showing there, right? So in our case, our DNS role has been installed on server one, whose IP is 192.168.200.1, right? So we're expecting a correct uh, name according to the best practice in the industry. So if we press enter here, NS lookup, you will see that it's not giving us the correct information. But if we keep it like that here right now our name resolution is working just fine right but the best practice is <coughs> go ahead and make it uh, give you the correct information when we are looking for it right otherwise name resolution is working fine because forward local zone is configured and uh, as far as windows is concerned windows environment is concerned we're good uh, name resolution is working fine uh, it resolves host names to ip addresses which is okay but nowadays you will see linux machines in the network so Linux machines, uh, reverse lookup zone has to be working for them. Uh, there is a, a messaging application called Exchange Server that is a very extensive application uh, for email management of the company. It requires that uh, reverse lookup zone has to be created inside DNS. But what is forward lookup zone? What is reverse lookup zone? What is he talking about? Is it? It's Monday, right? We understand. So anyway, guys, we have to fix everything here. We have to keep it best practice. First of all, information has to be correct. Then we're going to go inside. Uh, DNS, we're going to check what is forward lookup zone, why is it there, what is reverse lookup zone, why is it there, right? But we're going for most critical options, components one by one. So here, uh, default server name should be server1.netplusdomain.local. It should be showing like this, but it is not, right? Second thing, address was 192.168.1.1, but it's showing 127.001, which is not good. So let's fix the IP address first. So keep this window open. Uh, you can, don't close it, at least minimize it. You can minimize it, but don't close it, right? So go ahead and minimize the command prompt and go to local server here, local server, right? And on the right side, do we all see Ethernet zero? Everyone see saw that? Okay, so click that Ethernet zero here. We see again Ethernet zero here, which is okay. Double click that, go to the IP address area, go to properties, everyone there? If you're following by, let me know. Properties and then go down to version 4. Double click that. Now you can see that uh, we're sure that we put preferred DNS as 192.168.201, but it changed it to 127.001. Anyone knows the reason? Why are we seeing 127.001 there? It's a loopback address, right? So it is pointing to itself right now. So preferred DNS means, you know, which DNS are you connecting to now? So because when it restarted, it said uh, it uh, discovered, oh, DNS is on me. So I'm the DNS role. So it just pointed to it itself in the preferred DNS, which we want to be back to 192.168.200.1. It only does that once when it's installing and it discovers that, oh, I have a DNS server as well. So it just changes it to loopback address or pointing to me. I am the DNS, right? I'm preferring myself. I'm connecting to myself now. If you keep it like that, is there any well, when you're in installing DHCP at that time, it 
automatically detects uh, the current uh, preferred DNS settings and it can get that IP so you have to correct that mm -hmm. best practices we can correct it right away but name resolution is working fine even if it is here uh, so we're just uh, going for the industry best practice here so uh, let's go ahead press ok for an exchange overall so it is better if it is ok this IP address so press ok here go ahead if you have changed that go ahead press ok and ok and close and network connections close that as well network connections close that now is our command prompt still open command prompt mm -hmm. go back to that this is an interactive mode here so control C out of that control C out of that so you should be seeing this prompt C colon backslash windows system 32 again up arrow on the keyboard just use the arrow keys uh, the previous command will come and at least the IP address should be correct now enter yep. mm -hmm. okay still default server uh, is unknown we're just gonna make one more tweak in DNS and we're gonna be good uh, it's gonna be showing the whole uh, you know FQDN properly here so we're just gonna again minimize it don't close the command prompt uh, and just minimize it because we're gonna go to another area here so uh, we know that uh, active directory totally depends on DNS so let's visit the DNS console now tools once you go to tools do you see DNS let's go ahead and click that this one okay once we click the DNS here I hope everyone is on this window right so once we click server 1 which is the DNS server and expand that server 1 there's a forward lookup zone that resolves host names to IP addresses and there's a reverse lookup zone that resolves IP addresses to host names right this is very crucial when you have big enterprise applications that needs to be reverse looked up by other uh, DNS's so exchange server uh, best practices that you must have reverse lookup zone configured which by default is not configured when you install an Active Directory with DNS. So Active Directory, when it installs DNS, it automatically configures forward lookup zone, which is good for name resolution in a pure Windows environment. When you have Linux machines there, these are non-Windows uh, machines. Uh, suppose they have just an IP address there, uh, and uh, they want to know the name of that IP address or resolve a name to an IP address. So the request will go to reverse lookup zone there right which is not configured right now so in a, uh, in a Microsoft and non Microsoft environment better you must you should have uh, reverse lookup zone configured pure Microsoft environment only forward lookup uh, look zone is also okay right but okay. best practice is go for reverse lookup zone yeah Can you repeat the last, uh, yeah sure and uh, here forward lookup zone so it is resolving forward look up, uh, 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 computer name to IP address it is resolving that right so the best practice is for Microsoft and non-Microsoft networks when they are together and majority of the companies you will have Linux machines, Linux servers there uh, with their DNS uh, application as uh, it's uh, Linux DNS uh, application is bind I think right B-I-N-D. So uh, reverse lookup zone is uh, a best practice, it is a best practice to configure reverse lookup zone for Microsoft and non-Microsoft uh, you know servers communication plus for Microsoft enterprise applications that are making communication outside like exchange server uh, anyone ever heard of exchange server before uh, very silly question right <laughs> it's everywhere right so or maybe not so exchange 2003 exchange 2007 exchange 2010 exchange uh, online exchange 2013 and 2016 versions are there so reverse lookup zone is the best practice to be configured when you are installing exchange and you have exchange so always have because uh, you know whichever companies see your email coming from your company to their company so uh, their company DNS will all do a reverse check look up on you as well okay there's a name here I want to check its IP now is it some spammer who's sending us uh, spams from some domain name random domain name or is it a legit uh, exchange server environment there so they uh, do a reverse lookup on you and the request goes to the reverse lookup zone uh, reverse lookup zone says that oh you want to know the IP of that yeah there is IP so always configure reverse lookup zone normally it is configured on ISP uh, ISP is DNS that you put a reverse lookup zone when you have an exchange server so otherwise if your domain name goes into a blacklist global blacklist in the DNS servers your you know domain name will be blocked and your email will be rejected from all other messaging servers that is not the scenario you should be in because you cannot convince uh, 
you know, it, it's a very long process to convince them, hey, we are a legit domain and you cannot, you need that domain name. Some companies buy a domain name in $40,000, $50,000, just the name, right? Because it's going to give them millions of dollars of business. So, uh, reverse lookup zone, we need to configure for Microsoft and non-Microsoft communication as well as some enterprise applications that require it, right? So, uh, do we all see forward lookup zone here? And do we see netplus domain dot local here? If we click that netplus domain dot local, there, this is the zone created for this domain. Zone is an area where you have all the DNS settings configured. Now you can see a records here, which is just a name of a server and an IP of a server, right? So there, that is called host a records or just a records. So it is just an information about. So if you have thousands of you computers here, it will be a very long line of name of a server and an IP of a server. That's a record, right? So forward lookup zone uh, can resolve host names to IP addresses. If somebody has a host name, uh, the, then it can get uh, the request can go to the forward lookup zone and it will give you the IP address of that name. And reverse lookup zone, if you have an IP, it's going to give you the name of that zone, right? So uh, now forward lookup zone is configured. We're going to be talking about that uh, in detail as well, but we're right right now going for configuring reverse lookup zone. Again, I'm saying that. If you don't touch the reverse lookup zone, your Microsoft environment is working fine, right? So let's go for reverse lookup zone and right click that. And new zone. So let's create a new zone here. If everyone see that, click the new zone. And it is welcome to the new zone wizard. So let's click next. Now there's a primary zone. Zone is a DNS area where you tell the uh, DNS what to do or you, you configure the DNS, right? So there's a primary zone here, there's a secondary zone, stub zone, and store the zone in Active Directory. So when you create a new zone in Active Directory, or DNS actually, so primary zone is a read and write copy of that uh, DNS, right? So when you install a primary zone, primary zone has what? Just the name and IP of a machine. Name and IP, name and IP, name and IP, name and IP. Or MX records, it has C names, it has uh, all the other records, but the main thing is it has name and IP, right? So primary zone means it's a read and write copy, which means you can connect to a DNS, you can delete a, a record, and then that machine cannot be accessed by name. You need to know its IP then, right? You can make changes in DNS if it is installed with primary zone. It is read and write copy, right? You can make changes there. Secondary zone is a read only copy, just like Domain controller has a RODC, read-only domain controller. So DNS also has a read-only version of that as well. You cannot make any changes on the read-only copy of that uh, DNS zone. Secondary zone is read-only, right? So you can, it will just, uh, whatever primary zone has, it's going to be, uh, you know, replicated to uh, secondary zone and that's it. That's all you can do. So stub zone is for small branches where it doesn't have its own database. So if a user in a stub zone branch, uh, uh, you know, is looking for a printer in Toronto, uh, so stub zone does not have a local A record of that printer, but stub zone intelligently forwards that request to the, to that DNS server, which knows where is the printer, right? So uh, if I go for that uh, example here in the diagram, uh, so here we have uh, user in New York. Suppose uh, there's uh, another, uh, you know, area here called uh, Nunavut. Okay. Anyone ever heard of Nunavut before? Nunavut. Hey, what kind of Canadians are you and you don't know Nunavut? Okay. Just kidding. Vit? Nunavut. It's Vut. Yeah, it's uh, way far. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, there was a job opening there for system administrators and they were giving $700 per day and I applied and uh, you have to ski scooters there and they explained the whole thing to me uh, I applied there for VMware administrator and uh, you know active directory administrator and SCCM uh, they gave took a long interview but they took longer to explain what kind of environment is there so I I said that hey I know how to kill a bear with a you know harpoon and I was like ah, ha, ha, ha. maybe that's why I got rejected okay anyway but so <laughs> So, uh, no, no, what, if you have a remote branch there, and yeah, there is no land lines there, it's through satellite you're connected. So there is a latency in the internet. 
okay anyway if you have a nunavut uh, branch there and it has so it has just 10 users maybe so you can have a stub zone there and stub zone intelligently uh, forwards the request to that dns server which knows what the user is requesting right okay i was just, just made there so it will go to the correct dns server here and it will that dns server will tell that yes there's a printer in toronto and uh, yes this is a name so you can go ahead and access that so stub zone intelligently transfers the request to the correct dns server around it right stub zone for small branches and it transfers that request to okay guys so if we go ahead well first of all we did click the secondary zone and it unchecked this option here we do not want it to be unchecked so keep it on primary zone everyone please keep it on primary zone i was just selecting those options to uh, explain what they are but keep it on primary zone and go ahead and select that so what is this store the zone in active directory available only if dns server is a writable domain controller okay we understand that but what is this so this dns do you want it to be active directory integrated dns or do you want it to be standalone DNS? So definitely we want it to be Active Directory integrated DNS. So, wow, I still love this primitive application, seriously. So there is a AD integrated DNS uh, and there's a standalone DNS, right? And standalone DNS. Standalone DNS is standing alone. And uh, this one here is uh, integrated with Active Directory. What is the what are the benefits of integration with Active Directory? So, uh, DC to DC communication is always encrypted, right? Encrypted. So, so uh, AD integrated DNS to AD integrated. Seriously, I'm writing the whole thing. AD integrated DNS communication is also encrypted so if they are if dns is integrated to active directory the communication between the dns to dns will also be encrypted or secure or safe right hackers cannot decrypt that unless they are very geniuses or they have very expensive decryption application uh, so first thing is that second thing uh, these uh, uh, you know integrated dns uh, it uses or okay let me just write the whole thing or i'll just copy that it's too many words uh copy and integrated dns uses active directory topology for its own replication topology for its own replication so first of all the communication gets encrypted because if there are uh, so suppose there are two domain controllers here one domain controller is here and it is uh, dc to dc triple uh, a communication is going on so whatever you change here change here suppose you create 200 users here 200 users will be updated here as well and whatever else you do in active directory they will be updated here so whatever dns related changes you do of course dns will talk to the other dns and, and update here you create 200 uh, computers here or join the computers to domain uh, it will reflect it will replicate this information there the main thing is of course their replication across each other is secure because uh, they are uh, encrypted so it will be encrypted because they are ad integrated dns if they are standalone dns then you have to enable encryption separately they do not uh, automatically are encrypted then if it is standalone dns right so because they are ad integrated dns that's why the communication is encrypted always between the two so it's microsoft always recommends go for ad integrated dns always right so install a dns go ahead and install with active directory they're they're good so first one has active directory install a replica dc install uh, dns with it it's okay right second thing is it uses the topology which just means that if active directory is connected in toronto between each other then it is connected to ny and there are two domain controllers there and then it is connected to London and there are two domain controllers here. So they have a topology of their own to update each other. So Toronto domain controllers are connecting here, then New York domain controllers are connected here and London domain controllers are connected here. The DNS is here, the DNS is here as well in London. They will all replicate 
with this topology on top of this topology they will also replicate they will also update each other when domain control is replicating uh, updating domain, uh, dns will also replicate uh, and update each other as well across the branches right so dns uses uh, active directory topology dns uh, uses active directory uh, uh, security feature for their own replication encryption the replication is encrypted right so that's why ad integrated dns is always very important standalone dns uh, you can just uh, you know manually start encryption there you can manually enable all the features there you have to manually enable replication there as well right so it's all manual security standalone is manual security manual replication you have to enable all that yourself but once you enable they are replicating it too, right but the active directory they automatically get this dns automatically gets this from active directory because they're integrated to active directory right you understand that right ad integrated and standalone dns some features of that okay guys uh, try to make your notes for all the discussions this is very important uh, it is very easy to you know not do those uh, labs or not follow those notes and not do those uh, you know organized notes there but uh, you will find it later than that this is a go this was very uh, you know damaging for you the whole time will be wasted if you don't create your notes summarize notes of these discussions right so you must do those labs you must create those notes and please uh, uh, send me in Microsoft Word all your uh, notes and screenshots right okay guys so here uh, stub zone we t uh, talked about and uh, one picture just uh, shows at least uh, you know seven or eight critical topics here uh, so let's uh, go ahead right so uh, here so we know primary zone read and write copy of DNS database secondary zone read only copy of the DNS database stub zone does not have its own database it just refers to the refers intelligently to the correct DNS server right so that's what we know from here and store the zone in Active Directory it makes the DNS Active Directory integrated so it uh, gets those features from Active Directory it is now secure its replication is encrypted it uses uh, Active Directory topology right so this four areas here you need to know what they are so you can decide it better which branch to use which kind of DNS at what time right so if we understand that and uh, hopefully you're going to be creating those notes discussion notes when you hear the video again let's click next now the next option here just shows that oh you're creating a reverse circuit zone so you want to tell it to the, all the dns servers in the domain we have just one in our domain so it doesn't apply to us or you want to tell all the dns servers across the forest hey everyone i am creating a reverse circuit zone and i'm telling you update yourselves as well i have a reverse circuit zone now yay okay anyway uh, so you don't want to tell you want to tell uh, all the DNS servers in the forest it doesn't apply to us for now but we know what is that now or you want to tell all the older domain controllers that hey I have a reverse circuit zone do you want to update yourself or not right so none of that apply because we have just one DNS server but we now know what is that we're just updating other DNS servers if we have those within the domain within the forest or older DNS servers right so you want to update them you can choose according to that option the main thing is do we understand the purpose of this page right if you we do yeah what is the scenario like what is the best mm -hmm. practice <coughs> if we have a previously installed domain yep. what do we do if you do not have one uh better you have because uh, so normally with branches you have exchange servers as well there uh, you have enterprise applications that need that uh, record of uh, a record of those servers locally available instead of uh, Toronto user is trying to know where is that printer in New York so the local DNS should tell that mm -hmm. instead of going for van connection and creating that traffic yeah, right. so better tell everyone update all the DNS servers that if you're using services across a lot right. if it's a child domain then don't tell all the domains there just keep it to your domain if all the others are child domain because they have their own structure they don't want to know your records then you don't want to tell them uh, uh, their records. You don't, you don't want to know their records, right? So in child domain and tree domain, they have their own DNS scenarios there. They can tell their own uh, child domains uh, or they can tell their own different sites they're connected. So in, in case of child domain, we don't spread that. In case we have just sites with replica DCs, we tell all of them. 
right? So across uh, all the forest, you want to tell every child domain, it's uh, in cases of you have some service that is being offered in your branch only to the whole forest. Then you go ahead and do that. If you don't have any service, everyone has local services available, you don't have to tell everyone. That. Because then you're also initiating cross the van traffic to all the branches as well. So, okay guys, so we're gonna just stick to that. Within our domain, yes, this is the best option that other domain controllers, uh, DNSs in your domain should also be updated that you have a reverse circle zone now, right? So do we understand that all? Right, in next class I'll be quizzing. <laughs> So uh, it's uh, good that we're understanding, and uh, please do ask me a question if you don't understand something. If it's clear, let's go ahead. Next. Okay, we're not using IPv6, we're using IPv4. So the reverse circuit zone is there, we're good. We don't change any option here, right? And next. Okay, here we just need to tell what subnet, what network we are using here, right? Mm -hmm. So 192.168.200. That's it. it do, it's not interested in knowing the client IP because it just needs to know the network ID, not the client ID, right? So if we have that uh, uh, network ID, that's all we need to do and click next. Okay, this option here. Uh, now this is dynamic update. Of course, we want two DNS servers to securely and automatically update each other. So secure, yes, uh, they are encrypted, the communication is encrypted because they are Active Directory integrated DNS. Second thing is, do you want it automatic? So dynamic updates, yes, we want them to uh, automatically, uh, once there's a record created in one DNS server, please mm -hmm. automatically and securely update the other DNS server as well. Or you want both non-secure and secure dynamic updates. Anyone knows what's a non-secure and secure dynamic updates? What do you mean by secure here or non-secure here? Non-secure is uh, non-active directory integrated. Yeah, exactly. Standalone DNS server, active directory considers it as not secure because active directory does not know this server, having a DNS server, right? So definitely uh, non-secure means, oh, you're coming, you're getting a replication from uh, non-secure DNS server or the non-active directory joined DNS servers as well. So active directory considers it's non-secure, I don't know that guy, right? Or I don't know that uh, server here, so I consider it non-secure. Maybe it is secure, but from the point of active directory, it's non-secure. And secure, so this means maybe you have, uh, you know, DNS server uh, from uh, uh, Linux as well, you can just uh, select this option if you want update after you have proper protocols and communications done between the two. So, and then there is do not allow dynamic updates, this means automatically do not update. I'm gonna create A records on both myself. Yeah, right, are you kidding me? Yeah. Does this page apply to the clients when, because clients can also update their IP addresses when they first initialize? Mm -hmm. I guess it applies to that too or no? Well, it's not mainly that Active Directory knows DNS servers or not. It's purely for DNS servers itself. DNS that DNS. there's a standalone, and normally now there are standalone options. There are some third-party DNS servers that banks use as well, uh, and uh, then there are uh, you know Linux-based DNS servers as well that are extensively being used. So this doesn't apply to the no, mindset. this is just for the DNS servers itself. Okay, guys. So here, uh, allow only secure dynamic updates. That's exactly is the best option here. So we're just going to select this one, but we know that other options also apply according to our network environments, right? Do we understand that, right? So if you understand that, go ahead and click next. And that's it, finito, right? So click finish. Have we created that? Guys, make sure that you see 200.168.192 here on the right side, or if you expand that, it is 200.168, it's not 169, it is not 193 or something, right? So uh, it should be the correct IP, that's what I'm saying. Now, if we go inside this, we don't see any record of a machine here. We just have one machine right now, which is server one and its IP is 192.168.201, right? So if, this is empty right now, of course it is empty. So if we, do you all see Netplus domain up there? Yeah. Okay, click that Netplus domain. You have one machine record here. But there is no record for this in reverse lookup zone. Normally there has to be, if it is forward lookup zone, it is uh, there, then it is called A record. In reverse lookup zone it is called pointer record or PTR record. Uh, so this record has to be, or whatever records are here, 
must be inside reverse lookup zone as well. So in order to put that there, what do we do? We just double click server 01, double click server 01, and you can see here update associated pointer record. This is only uh, applicable when you have a reverse lookup zone here. Then only you can apply that. And best practices, go ahead and create one. You must have, you should have uh, in today's environment a reverse lookup zone there. It's no longer purely Microsoft, right? So update associated pointer, and it's not like Microsoft or non Microsoft. It is uh, Exchange Server and some enterprise applications uh, have that best practices of having a reverse lookup zone there. Okay, so once you do that, click apply and okay and do you see server up there this one go ahead and just click a couple of million times refresh refresh refresh, refresh. okay so once it is done go down here reverse lookup zone go down here do we all see this ptr or pointer record okay pointer record is there right so uh, i'm just going to server again refresh refresh for a couple of million time more and then I'm just gonna leave this screen open here and go down. Do we have this command prompt still open? Mm -hmm. Command prompt is still open? Mm -hmm. Everyone there? Yep. Anyone falling behind? Mm -hmm. Okay, command prompt still open, control C out of that again. And up arrow again, NS lookup, right? And do we see our FQDN here? Or do we need to give two more commands here? Enter, now we see the best practice being followed and we see proper full FQDN, fully qualified domain name just means that server name of the server, name of the domain, right? So this is appearing here for everyone, right? Now suppose it did not, oh, mm, red alert here. Whoop, whoop. It did not? No. Hey, somebody did not follow or miss a step. You may have missed a step, but uh, okay. Oh, it's in the reverse Yeah, it is there. Yeah. Then refresh. Just uh, click the server one. So see this. Click the server one and refresh a couple of million times. That's why the word couple of million. <laughs> refresh. It really needs a refresh. So do you see in the reverse circle zone? Yeah. Mary, do you see in the reverse circle zone? Uh, after that, go to command prompt, control C out of that, and mm -hmm. NS look up again. No, right? You see that or not? Still unknown. Mm. Okay, uh, guys, I wanted to give you two more commands uh, because it worked here. But uh, thank you that it didn't work for. Uh, but you have that uh, reverse lookup zone. It's showing here, right? Yes. It is crucial that it should be showing here. Yes. Mary, do you see that here? Yeah. Okay, good. So, guys, uh, both for those, it's not working. Go to command prompt again. It may happen that it may not work with whatever we did. It may not work. It still does not show that. So go back to Control C. There are two commands here: IP config flush DNS and IP config register DNS. So Control C out of that, and just for record, just uh, these are good for DNS troubleshooting. So IP config uh, space forward slash flush DNS is one word. It just ref, you know removes the current uh, DNS information from the cache, DNS cache, and then register DNS is the other one. But for register DNS, you must be administrator private. Yeah. Yeah. Right click, command prompt with admin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, when you right click, no, no, no. See this, Mary. Right click. Do you see this command prompt admin? Hmm, why did we close that command prompt? Hmm, somebody is uh, not following the steps. Uh. Okay, so IP config, space, forward slash, flush DNS, did you do that? Yeah. Press enter, and then register DNS is the other word. Instead of flush DNS, register DNS. Again, put the command, remove flush DNS, put register DNS, one word. So uh, if you put that, press enter, right? And uh, up arrow again, put the command again, but this time remove the flush DNS. Guys, this is for everyone that you should know these two commands here if you are uh, troubleshooting. Suppose one client is so stubborn it cannot resolve a name. Uh, you can go to host file there and try to put that name there. It's not going to go to DNS. It's going to check the local host file and then and go then there. NS uh, yeah, then go ahead and do NS lookup. Register DNS. Where you got it, right? 
So the uh, IP config slash space slash red rest jitter in Georgia. What? Uh, register DNS. Enter. Still unknown? Mm, we missed a major, major, major step. Not minor, minor, minor step. Okay, guys. So, okay, guys. We still have half an hour, right? So, okay. Well, okay, now everyone will be like, what did you just say, teach? Okay, uh, so let's t shoot this and uh, the rest. Uh, we still have to do so. Guys, we're going slow because we want to make sure that we understand everything, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, these labs are like, you know, in <laughs> half an hour, I would have finished the whole lab. You know, that this, uh, these. So, accurately, we just did that. We tried to understand GC, DNS, name resolution, what are the portions, components, dif uh, different components of that. We still have to go for DHCP and do all this. Then our basic environment is up and running, but we understand each and every component and see that. Uh, what is the best practices uh, that you do when you are actually applying a basic network in your production environment, right? Yeah, so now I'm uh, coming there. So guys, what's the call here? I don't know when teacher is not stopping the class. Can you arrest him, please? Okay. Good. For today. good? Mm, hey, you have a very strong coffee now. So we're good for next half an hour. Just kidding. Okay, guys. So let's just take a break uh, for the till the next Friday. <laughs> uh, better take a snapshot. It's okay. Uh, it's up to you now. Well, yeah, good idea. Because our activity is installed, DNS installed. This is at least minimum we need if we want to go back to the snapshot. So, guys, here. Uh, I'm coming to you, and uh, if it is not working, please do not take a snapshot. I'm going to quickly resolve that, uh, try to resolve that quickly. So, guys, the rest who are done with that and can see that FQDN, right click server one, go to snapshot, take snapshot, or oh, come there, right? Yeah. So, you don't have to do that. Uh, take snapshot and snapshot two of server one. So, AD DNS installed. And go ahead and so AD slash DNS install, data snap, snapshot, and shut down the server. We're gonna do the rest. Some of the labs are shorter now, but if you're understanding everything, we're good, right? So take snapshot, please redo the whole lab and uh, try to take the notes down, summarize in your own words the whole discussion and the best practices, right? So take snapshot, once this is done, right click and, right click and shut down guest. Power, shut down guest. Power shutdown guest. If you're not, not able to see the videos, please email me. Yes. If you're not able to uh, uh, receive communication, please email me. Yeah, so uh, I haven't added you yet in the videos. So I'm going to add your Gmail there. So after that, I'm going to email you and uh, you can just let me, oh yeah, I'm able to see that, right? At home. So just let me know if anything is missing. Please email me because I can forget. I'm uh, doing the same thing for other classes. They let me know. So don't be shy. Just let me know if something is missing, right? Okay, guys. So I'm um, just going to stop the video here.